and welcome to this fourth day of public hearings on Bill 96, which have been organized by the Quebec Community Groups Network. Bonjour et bienvenue à la quatrième journée d'audience publique sur le projet de loi 96 organisé par le QCGN. The offices of the QCGN are situated on the traditional territory of the Ghanaian Gahaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among many First Nations, including the Ghanaian Gahaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Huron Wendat, Abenaki, and the Anishinaabeg. Abeg, I'm sorry. We recognize and respect the Ghanaian Gahaga as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. So if you may, if you uh, permit, I'd like to start by introducing my colleagues on this panel. Eleni Bakopanos was a member of parliament for more than 15 years and is a tireless advocate for women's rights. Marcus Tabachnik is the former chair of the Lester B. Pearson School Board, former president and executive director of the Quebec English School Boards Association and former president of the Canadian School Boards Association. One of our colleagues cannot be here today. He is Thomas Ledwell, a former journalist who recently served as a senior manager at the Trudeau Foundation. And I am Joan Fraser. I'm a former senator and a former editor of the Montreal Gazette. And it's my honor to be moderating today's proceedings. <coughs> I'm pleased to tell you that our initiative has proven to be very popular. And that as a result, we have added another day to our hearings. We'll be reconvening on Friday when we will be joined by res representatives of the Lord Reading Society and the QCGN Health and Social Services Committee. The impact on ac access to health and social services has not yet been discussed. And my sense is that this will be an important presentation. Le format de ces audiences est simple. Chaque invité disposera d'une période d'environ 15 minutes pour faire ses commentaires et sa présentation. Cela sera suivi par une période d'échange de 10 à 15 minutes entre les témoins et notre panel. Les présentations peuvent être faites en anglais ou en français, tout comme les questions et réponses qui suivront. Because we have a long list of very important presenters to hear today, I'm going to be quite ruthless about keeping time so nobody should feel a bit insulted, if at all insulted, if I lean in and say, say your time is running out. It's just a matter of courtesy to all the presenters. I should point out that viewers are also welcome to provide feedback in the chat and to suggest questions for the panelists to ask the presenters. Furthermore, the hearing is being videotaped and will be available online via the QCVN website. Le but de ces audiences est de permettre ce que le gouvernement du Québec a étouffé c'est-à-dire une discussion libre et ouverte sur les effets potentiels du projet de loi 96. All the presenters speak for themselves. They don't speak for the QCGN. They are here to speak to the QCGN, to inform the QCGN's presentation before the National Assembly Committee. And we all know that these are hot button topics but it's very important that we avoid inflammatory language. Inflammatory language inflames, but it doesn't enlighten. We want these hearings to be a forum in which we all learn from the many different perspectives of our different communities. Now, for our first presenter, who really doesn't need an introduction, Julius Gray has had an, illust an illustrious career pleading before the Supreme Court more than 50 times. More important, Julius is a strong and articulate advocate for individual and human rights. He has written on Bill 96, and we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say this morning. Julius, are you there? Uh, je voulais uh, vous parler de deux aspects de cette loi. Uh, il y avait deux articles que j'ai publiés, un en anglais sur l'amendement constitutionnel et la clause non obstant, et l'autre la, en français, euh, sur la loi 96, euh, son contenu. Euh, je, je vais dire deux choses sur l'amendement constitutionnel. D'abord, il est toujours dangereux d'adopter un amendement. Euh, les gens disent ça ne veut rien dire. Rien ne va changer. Rien n'est moins sûr. Il est certain, quand on, en, 
écoute ce que disent les, les, les panélistes à Québec, il y a beaucoup qui disent que ce n'est pas fini, que ce n'est pas assez, que cette loi ne règle pas la question. L'amendement constitutionnel va être utilisé dans l'avenir pour justifier que ce soit la loi 21 euh, sur l'aspect d'éducation, euh, euh, pour justifier euh, les amendements euh, au, à, à, au système de justice. Et c'est complètement vague. C'est comme lancer les dés et penser que tout va, aller, tout va bien aller. Euh, il est surprenant, surprenant qu'il y ait des gens, et les, les, tous les partis politiques, à l'unanimité, appuient un amendement, un, un, un saut dans le noir, euh, où il n'y a absolument aucune raison pour changer la Constitution. L'utilisation de la clause non-obstant, encore une fois, euh, c'est euh, choquant et ça démontre que euh, les valeurs fondamentales de ceux qui proposent cette loi euh, ne sont pas les mêmes que, que, que de ceux qui tiennent au, au, à la charte. En d'autres termes, euh, on entend les mots « les droits de la nation » ou d'autres choses comme étant plus importants que les chartes des droits et des libertés. Je ne pense pas que le but de la clause non-obstant était de permettre son abrogation chaque fois qu'on considère qu'une politique est importante. Je pense qu'au contraire, que les libertés, les droits fondamentaux, sont la base de toutes les sociétés démocratiques, y compris le Québec, et que l'idée que l'on puisse s'en débarrasser en utilisant la clause non obstant est quelque peu décevante et très dangereuse. Une chose qui m'inquiète énormément, c'est cette unanimité où tous les partis politiques, où l'Assemblée nationale, à l'unanimité, condamne, euh, demande qu'on accepte euh, le, le concept de la nation. Je veux tout de suite vous dire que je pense que le Québec remplit toutes les conditions pour être une nation en sociologie et en territoire, une langue, une tradition, un sentiment d'appartenance. Alors, pour moi, si vous me demandiez est-ce que c'est une nation, je dirais oui. Mais ce que je n'aime pas, c'est le dogme politique. Il faut absolument être d'accord. À l'unanimité, si quelqu'un dit, moi, je ne pense pas, je pense que la nation, c'est le Canada, ou la nation, c'est je ne sais pas quoi, ou il n'y a pas de nation, que cette opinion-là soit choquante. Ce n'est pas la mienne. Moi, je pense que le Québec remplit les conditions, mais je pense que l'unanimité L'unanimité de l'Assemblée nationale, des partis politiques, est très inquiétante. Quand la loi 101 a été adoptée, et je viendrai à ça en discutant de, 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 de la loi 96, parce que je pense qu'au fond, la loi 101, malgré les défauts au début qui ont été corrigés, est une bonne loi. Elle a été discutée, elle a été débattue. Il n'y avait pas cette fameuse unanimité. Mais aujourd'hui, dans l'atmosphère, ce n'est pas seulement au Québec, c'est partout, je pense, le niveau de débat euh, euh, tombe et ce qu'on a, c'est ce qu un, une unanimité et le cœur des indignés. Comment a-t-il pu penser telle et telle chose Sur tout sujet controversé, et pas seulement sur celui-ci, je pense qu'il faut retourner à une situation où on peut débattre des choses controversées, des choses avec lesquelles, euh, et je veux vous dire, si on si il fallait un débat sur la notion que euh, la Terre n'est pas plate, il n'y aurait pas de débat parce qu'il n'y a personne qui le croit. Mais ici, il est certain qu'il y a un débat à faire. Il y a un débat à faire et aucun parti politique, aucun chef, personne ne veut débattre. C'est triste, c'est dangereux. Maintenant, on vient à la loi 96 elle-même. Et je pense que tout dans cette loi a été présenté euh, de façon erronée. D'abord, il n'y a pas de danger à la langue française aujourd'hui. Pourquoi est-ce que je dis ça Il y avait un danger, un danger qui justifiait la loi 101, c'est que euh, si tout le monde fréquentait l'école anglaise, il est vrai que la vie, ce qui est arrivé au pays de Galles, quand tout le monde fréquentait l'école anglaise ou en Louisiane, euh, pourrait arriver. Mais il n'y a pas un seul exemple historique d'un pays où il y avait 
un système d'éducation gratuit et obligatoire dans une langue où cette langue a disparu. Et le Québec a ça. Il y a des écoles minoritaires, mais il est certain que la grande majorité des Québécois sont obligés de fréquenter gratuitement les écoles euh, françaises. Et ce n'est pas le collège ou le cégep ou les institutions de, supérieures qui vont changer de ça. Il n'y a pas un seul exemple. Maintenant, les gens qui présentent euh, à Québec et qui disent que ce n'est pas assez suivent la pensée de François Lacroix euh, qui dit que les institutions anglaises euh, euh, sont surfinancées. C'est faux pour deux raisons. D'abord, parce qu'elles sont à Montréal. Et à Montréal, ce n'est pas 10 ou 5 Il est certain qu'à Montréal, il y a de 30 à 40 des gens qui parlent mieux anglais que français. Pas important, mais euh, dans le contexte de Montréal, ils ne sont pas surfinancés. Mais il y a une autre chose. Il n'y a pas d'institution anglophone. Ce sont des institutions bilingues. Donc, elles desservent les deux communautés. Alors, si on compte le pourcentage d'argent pour le Royal Vic ou McGill, il faut euh, dire que c'est euh, euh, la moitié de ce qu'il compte. Alors, il ce n'est pas vrai qu'il y a trop d'institutions anglophones. Et euh, il n'est pas vrai que la langue française perd du, euh, son influence. Au contraire, si on compare ça, et là, je veux utiliser la carte de l'âge, si je me souviens de mon enfance, des années 60, de, de mon adolescence, toutes les affiches étaient en anglais. L'anglais dominait totalement au centre-ville. Le français se porte mieux. Donc, la théorie du danger est fausse, est erronée, est erronée, et ce n'est pas du tout soutenable que le français risque de disparaître. Mais il y a une autre chose. Supposons qu'il y a un certain danger. Supposons, ce n'est pas vrai, mais supposons-le. Y a-t-il un lien entre le fait de ne pas offrir les services, par exemple aux gens qui ne sont pas les, euh, diviser les anglophones en deux, les anglophones des vieilles souches et les autres, ne pas offrir des services, est-ce que ça aide les Français Parce que n'oubliez pas que ceux qui vont être lésés, c'est les anglophones faibles, les unilingues qui ne peuvent pas travailler, les autochtones, les, les gens, euh, on, veut, on leur dira « non, vous n'êtes pas une personne qui, qui a la carte d'anglophone euh, de souche, qui a le droit au service ». Comment est-ce que ça aide le français Comment est-ce que la création d'une bureaucratie énorme, avec des dangers pour les libertés publiques, parce qu'ils vont pouvoir aller dans nos ordinateurs, vérifier qui a parlé quelle langue chez le médecin, et j'ajoute que la langue qu'un individu parle chez le médecin, quand en, en, en crise, ça doit être son choix. Euh, le, la personne, euh, ou, ou devant les autorités d'un pot ou d'autre, l'individu va s'exprimer comme, comme mieux il peut. Euh, Comment est-ce que cela aide le français Il n'y a aucun lien entre la création de cette bureaucratie et euh, l'aide euh, aux francophones. C'est clair que la loi est discriminatoire, euh, la clause non-obstant ne serait pas invoquée. Ils savent bien qu'elle est discriminatoire, malgré le fait qu'ils s'indignent aujourd'hui à la mention possible de discrimination. Mais il y a une autre chose qui n'est pas mentionnée. Ce n'est pas dans l'intérêt des francophones. Ce n'est pas dans l'intérêt des francophones d'être exclus des cégeps anglophones. Nous sommes en Amérique du Nord. On ne peut pas cloisonner le Québec. Tout le monde doit apprendre à parler. Pour une carrière réussie, il faut parler le deux langues. Il n'y a pas d'assimilation qui arrive au niveau de l'université ou de collège. Euh, les anglophones ont un choix, les francophones n'en ont pas. C'est injuste envers les francophones, mais je pense que c'est peut-être un peu inévitable. Cependant, euh, il ne faut pas creuser cette injustice et l'étendre au cégep et aux autres institutions. Donc, c'est injuste envers euh, les, les, les francophones et ça ne donne rien, euh, ça les empêche, ça empêche tout le monde d'avoir une carrière tout à fait réussi, sans apporter quoi que ce soit. Et finalement, euh, j'ajouterais que certaines choses sont clairement inconstitutionnelles. Les changements dans les, les, euh, 
et le système de justice. Et je me pose la question, en quoi est-ce que ça aide le français d'obliger quelqu'un d'ajouter à, à ses dépenses une version française de chaque procédure, alors que le système de justice fonctionne très bien dans les deux langues. J'ai eu l'expérience de ça. Jamais je n'ai eu une situation où, du point de vue linguistique, le système ne fonctionnait pas. Alors, euh, euh, la conclusion, c'est que c'est une loi mal conçue qui n'est... Le français n'est pas vraiment en danger, pas du tout. Mais si il est beaucoup plus euh, euh, fort, et, et, et c'est bien, moi je suis en faveur, il est beaucoup plus fort qu'il y a 40 ans, les mesures suggérées n'aident pas le français et l'amendement constitutionnel est un, un danger pour tout le monde. Surtout, on a une illustration de cette fameuse unanimité qui euh, euh, nuit à toute notre société sur les, les, les questions controversées, quelles qu'elles soient. Quand on parle de cette fameuse unanimité, je vais terminer avec ça, je pense que mes 15 minutes sont à peu près terminées, donc je pense qu'il faut féliciter Francine Pelletier, qui aujourd'hui a publié un article dissident dans Le Devoir. Ça veut dire que la démocratie continue à fonctionner. Ce n'est pas fréquent de voir ça, mais je pense que nous devrions tous être reconnaissants qu'il y a des gens comme Francine Pelletier qui ont osé dire les choses qu'elle a dit et je pense que nous devons nous faire entendre sur ces points et ce n'est pas une insulte au peuple québécois que dire que c'est une loi mal conçue, au contraire c'est un signe de respect, je me considère comme complètement québécois c'est un signe de respect de dire cette loi est mauvaise, elle est mauvaise merci merci beaucoup Julius, thank you very much And now our panelists get to ask you questions. Eleni and Marcus, do you have questions? Eleni. Thank you very much, uh, Julius, and we appreciate very much all the work. Peut-être je vais aller en français, compte tenu que tu as allé en français aussi. <laughs> Mais je sais que la plupart des gens qui nous écoutent sont, sont anglophones. Uh, vous, avez, vous avez soulevé des points qui d'autres qui sont venus devant nous aussi ont soulevé. Moi, je, je veux juste vous demander, parce que vous avez certainement euh, l'expertise euh, concernant euh, qu'est-ce qu'un de nos panélistes, que tu connais bien, euh, Michael Bergman, a dit, qu'on va avoir une crise constitutionnelle. Parce que de qu'est-ce que la plupart des panélistes nous encouragent, c'est de s'assurer, pas nous-mêmes, mais... Euh, les élus peut-être et nous et d'autres qui sont intéressés de prendre le chemin juridique. Euh, parce que c'est clair que l'Assemblée nationale va adopter cette loi. Euh, et probablement, peut-être, on espérons qu'il va avoir des amendements. C'est ça qu'on va travailler pour la, euh, notre organisme. On va travailler certainement avec tout ce qu'on a écouté pour faire des amendements. Mais c'est clair que ça va aller euh, dans le processus juridique qui peut prendre plusieurs années. Euh, Est-ce que tu es aussi de l'opinion que euh, nous sommes dans une euh, impasse ou une euh, crise constitutionnelle en ce qui concerne ce type de loi et sans oublier que la loi 21 fait le chemin dans les cours à ce moment je pense qu'il est certain, inévitable, et, et, et c'est une bonne chose. Cette loi va être contestée. Il y a des choses qui sont manifestement euh, contestables, même si on tient abstraction de la question de la loi euh, de la clause non obstant, parce que celle-là est déjà devant la, la Cour dans, dans, dans l'autre cause. Euh, mais le, le système de justice, euh, l'amendement constitutionnel, euh, toutes ces choses-là euh, seront clairement contesté et je pense qu'il devrait y avoir du succès. Mais ce qui va arriver, bien sûr, c'est qu'une pression va être mise. Si le tribunal dit c'est illégal, ah bon, c'est une autre insulte, ils ne nous suivent pas, nous sommes différents. Et je, je pense que euh, ce n'est pas seulement une crise constitutionnelle qu'on a, mais ce qu'on a, c'est un, 
une, 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 un mouvement vers une souveraineté du Québec euh, graduelle. Je pense que euh, les auteurs de cette loi et de cet amendement constitutionnel ont compris que le Québec euh, ne votera probablement jamais oui à un référendum parce que les conséquences économiques sont trop grandes. Alors, ils voudraient accomplir ça comme le Canada l'a fait en plusieurs étapes, la loi de 1867, Statute of Westminster, la citoyenneté canadienne en 1947, on est dans une situation, et quand M. Legault demande le droit de retrait de tout programme fédéral avec compensation, ça veut dire que d'ici 30 ou 40 ans, le Québec ne participera que dans l'armée peut-être, et euh, euh, l'assurance chômage et pérécation, mais rien d'autre. Euh, je pense qu'on a une, euh, une souveraineté en, euh, euh, progressiste, progressive. Je souligne tout de suite, ce n'est pas immoral, ce n'est pas injuste, ce n'est pas illégal. Je pense que si un référendum arrivait, ce serait légal et ce serait légitime. Et moi, je resterai au Québec parce que je, je suis Québécois. Et euh, ce n'est pas parce que le Québec vote pour quelque chose euh, qui ne me plaît pas que je, je voudrais partir. Seulement, ma position, encore une fois, c'est si on va s'embarquer sur un changement de cette envergure-là, qui est légitime et raisonnable, je ne questionne pas, je ne remets pas ça en doute, euh, il faudrait en discuter, en parler. Mais maintenant, il n'y a pas de discussion possible, il n'y a que l'unanimité euh, de tous les partis, tout le temps, chaque fois qu'une question controversée est là. Oui, il va y avoir une contestation qui réussira en partie au moins, il va y avoir une... Euh, d'autres demandes on a déjà entendu les gens qui ont dit euh, au comité euh, à l'Assemblée nationale que cette loi ne va pas assez loin donc on va avoir d'autres amendements à chaque élection euh, on, va, on voudra faire ça euh, et, et euh, on utilisera l'amendement constitutionnel comme justification mais à long terme la question est est-ce que le Canada est un pays ou un marché commun Merci. Marcus. Marcus, do you have a question? Thank you, John. Uh, merci, même très. Je continue en um, français. Mais, uh, comme I, si... I'm going to suggest that we use a little bit of English. All right, sure. I will just, some some, I will just some of the people that, at the meeting and uh, watching it uh, I was don't just going speak. to say that, John, that uh, I can continue in French, but out of respect to those people who prefer to hear some English, I'm going to switch my comment or question to English. Uh, Maitre, you, you um, refer to injustice in the bill towards francophones, towards the French population of Quebec, yet 70% plus, uh, according to polls, support the bill or are in favor of it. What strategies do you see or what, what items within the bill need to be highlighted in order to ex better explain the injustices towards the majority community? I think it's always a matter of discussion, education, and unfortunately, uh, the nature of nationalism, but it's not Quebec, it's any, you look at Irish, uh, you look at the debates between Israel and Poland about who is to blame for the Holocaust, the nature of nationalism that people support their cause, at least initially their group, there is a certain, and I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody for, for doing that. Uh, the, but the fact that 70% of the people at this point support something doesn't mean uh, that it can't be wrong. Uh, all sorts of policies were adopted at various times by democratic governments that turned out to be wrong. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I don't want to get partisan and offend some other people, but I think the 52% that voted for Brexit was wrong. And, and they're paying the prices now an empty shelf. So what you have to do is not say there is no democracy. Of course, the democracy means that the majority adopts its law, but it means that you just keep talking and saying the fact that 70% support uh, this doesn't mean that it's right and doesn't mean that it is in their interest. People often support things that are not in their interest, but I suggest to you that if you are right and 70% of the people are in favor, it still leaves 30%, which is a 
a very significant percentage. It is regrettable that there isn't a debate and that there isn't a single politician that is willing to speak for 30% of the people who don't agree. So I respect the majority and the majority's feeling. I note that wherever there is nationalism of any sort, and it's not a Quebec remark, it's world remark, uh, people tend to be loyal to the group, but in the long run, they do realize uh, that, uh, for instance, in the case of Brexit, that uh, it, it was a, 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 an incorrect uh, decision. And uh, there has to be a debate, and there has to be somebody who will be willing, some politician, some uh, uh, philosopher, professors, etc. And I noted Francine Pelletier, who is willing to take part in a debate about this. And we just have to continue, however politically incorrect it is, however much our trolls come after us, we have to continue talking freely, calmly, as Quebecers, saying this is not right. I'm going to sneak in a question of my own. Um, I'm assuming that the, um, the bill's provisions about the judicial system would be attackable in court because of the provisions in the British North America Act. What about the constitutional amendment? Do you think that Quebec can make that kind of amendment, which does affect the use of the English and French languages, um, unilaterally, or would it, would it need the uh, assent of parliament? The formalist. I, I think it's an illegal amendment, and I think, uh, in, 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 I mean, the better opinion, if you just looked at our at law, but law is not done in a vacuum, and courts are not in a vacuum. The best example of that, that thank God it changed, was that in 1895, on the basis of the same constitution, Supreme Court of the United States thought separate but equal was equal, and in 1954, thank God, they realized that it wasn't equal, and they changed it. And so in the atmosphere, in which we are living uh, with all governments supporting it. And for all you know, the Parliament of Canada will give its consent. It would take, I think, and it should take a courageous judiciary to say, this is not an amendment to the constitution of the province. Constitution of the province meant getting rid of the legislative council, for instance, or changing uh, the structure of the National Assembly, changing, uh, ha having a president or something. That's just in the province rather than, uh, but changing um, uh, the, <clears throat> the constitution which affects other places and which will inevitably lead other provinces. And the first thing that jumps to mind is Alberta, which is already holding a referendum on uh, uh, the uh, equalization payments. We're taking over those away would make it all fall apart. Um, the, uh, it's, not, it's not valid and I hope the courts say so, but it's difficult to imagine that this will be so in an atmosphere in which parliament probably jumps on board, in which nominations to the Supreme Court are now partly provincial and so on. It's not certain, of course, it won't affect this decision because they will not have named that many people. But uh, in the long run, courts do not act in a vacuum. And when this famous unanimity sets in, they might go along with it, uh, as the Supreme Court of the United States did in 1895. But one day people will awake to the fact that this is probably illegal and very dangerous, that you can't have, uh, if you have a country rather than a common market, you can't have a single unit change the constitution of the country. So it's illegal, but I'm not 100% sure that it'll, I, I think the judicial parts will get struck down. I hope the constitutional amendment gets struck down, but there's going to be tremendous pressure uh, of a non-legal sort not to strike it. Thank you so much. Uh, you're always stimulating to listen to and never less, never more so than today. Um, I, I think that you, you touched a common nerve when you said we need to have debates. We need to have debates on these matters. That's a theme that has come up several times in these hearings and I expect will come up again. And you certainly do your bit to contribute to debates. So thank you very much. Julie. It's a pleasure, always a pleasure. Um, our next three speakers will focus on the impact of Bill 96 on specific communities. First up is 
or is scheduled to be Jeanette Perignon of the Filipino Heritage of Montreal, which is a grassroots organization that provides support and programming from meals to those in need to digital storytelling. And I know that Jeanette was having a little bit of computer problem. Jeanette, are you there and have your problems been solved? Hello, Marcus here on mute. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you beautifully. Hear you. Yes. Yes, I can, I can hear you. Okay, and yeah, I changed the device, so uh, I'm okay now. Okay. Can you see me though? No, we cannot see you. Oh, oh how come, okay. Um, but the most important thing is that we can hear you. Yes, so you, that's right, okay. So if you can't get the camera to work, then just go ahead and there you are. Oh, there I am. <laughs> there Finally. you are. Okay, so okay, the floor is yours. Thank you, sorry Welcome for that uh, little bit of a technical problem. Okay, so I can start? Yes. Okay, good morning, fellow community members. At the outset, I'm thankful and privileged to be part of this event. Thank you, uh, QCGN, for giving me this opportunity to have our voice heard. Uh, my name is Jeanette Pirignon, and I represent not only the Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal, where I am the secretary, but also the Cahirop Association of Quebec, I'm the president, and the Philippine Benevolent Scholarship Society of Quebec, where I'm the secretary, and the seniors of West Island and suburbs, where I'm one of the directors, and of course, all the Filipinos in our community. We stand with the Quebec Community Groups Network and our fellow English-speaking minority groups with concerns on the impact of Bill 96, an act that respects French as the only official and common language of Quebec. We understand the importance and the need to protect the French language. However, with this new bill, it does not only reinforce French as a primary language in the province, but it also hinders on all other groups to exercise the right to speak any other language in public spaces of work and education. For example, Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal represent a community with Tagalog, our mother tongue, and English as our primary languages for communication. This is extremely troubling. If Bill 96 were to be adopted, a community, its members, and their businesses will be at constant risk of receiving fines and being under the watchful eye for possible violations. As members of the English minority, uh, English speaking minority, we understand that Bill 96 will also affect our ability to receive services in English. It is already quite difficult to receive aid or translations of documents provided solely in French. Bill 96 will only increase the difficulty of our community members to receive the services they contribute to pay for through their taxes. We know that Bill 96 is a provincial law. If adopted, it will deeply affect the English speaking community, including the Filipino community. Filipinos have no access to English schools because they weren't educated in English in Canada. We need English language access. Everyone should have access to English language, not only people that have historical rights. Immigrants coming to Quebec cannot be sworn in as citizens if they don't have proficiency in French. All across Canada, the rule is that you need to know either English or French to be sworn in as citizens. Why is it different in Quebec? A lot of adults and children in the Filipino community work hard to learn French, but older people who work more than one or two jobs or even more than that as caregivers mostly work in an environment where English is the only spoken language. They don't have time or too tired to learn French. These people have every right to be able to become citizens of Canada after they have completed their permanent residency period, even if they only speak English. Filipino professional immigrants 
with years of experience abroad cannot exercise their profession in Quebec. Why? Because they have difficulty to be sufficiently fluent in French. Older immigrants have difficulties to learn a new language, but one must realize that their children will become fluent in French. It doesn't make sense to expect the Filipino seniors speak French sufficiently in hospitals and other public places. Therefore, there must be a minimum service provided to them in English. The Filipino community stands in solidarity with QCGN and the English speaking minority in addressing our concerns on the adoption of Bill 96 and the effects it will have on our communities. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be heard on behalf of my fellow citizens, Filipinos. May I be allowed to introduce another member of Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal to add more insights on this issue? I mentioned it already earlier. It's Ricardo Ribaya. Hello. Is, Hello. Is Ricardo there? Ricardo? Perhaps not. Oh, Ricardo. Anyway, my my presentation is not as long as uh, Mr. Uh, Julius Gray. <laughs> anyway, at least our voice can be heard. And that's the important thing. And of course, we have some questions. Eleni, do you have a question? Sure. Thank you very much, Jeanette, uh, for bringing another perspective to these consultations from the allophone communities and the impact of Bill 96. Um, I think one of the main points you raised has been raised by other uh, speakers also in terms of access to uh, social services, access to English language. But at the same time, you raised the issue of the next generation and uh, the fact that they first of all, will be speaking French. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing. I think the more languages you speak, <laughs> the better that, that you are a citizen of the world. Uh, but are you seeing uh, another generation of Filipinos who are perfectly bilingual or trilingual, I may even use that term, and who are facing certain difficulties in terms of their integration? Because I know the first generation obviously has, and, and I know it from firsthand also, uh, because I was an immigrant to this country too. So I know the first generation, it's harder. The second, it's a lot easier. And the third, hopefully, are fully integrated. Do you think Bill 96 will make it even harder for them to, to feel that they're fully integrated and that they have the same job opportunities as anyone else in Quebec? Well, I guess the next generation, uh, as an example, my children, they are uh, fully bilingual, so I don't think they will have problems with that. But uh, families whose parents are both Filipinos or or any other um, race who speak their native uh, tongue, um, maybe their children would be able to speak French too because of the school schooling, and um, maybe um, there won't be as much uh, problem if the Bill ninety six is passed. But I'm just concerned about the, the, the present day, you know, the more of the seniors and the older people who are too tired already, you know, to still or no, even no time to, to go and um, learn French. So I think the future generation, they might uh, be able to integrate because, uh, you know, the, only if they're permitted to go as well uh, in English, Oh, just a minute now. No, they're going to a French school. They are kind of almost uh, uh, forced to go to, English, uh, to a French school because their parents were not educated in, in uh, French or, uh, you know, in other parts in English. of Canada. In, in English. English, English, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, in English. No, that's okay. So that's anyway, okay. So, so the impact is going to be more on the seniors and in yes, terms of so access so. to services is, is more what you think will happen if Bill 96 is adopted. Yeah, correct. Okay. Because right now the seniors, you see, if they receive uh, uh, French uh, documents and they can't uh, read or understand it, they have sometimes they have children who are already bilingual, so they have to go and ask their children. But then again, their children are too busy, you know, so they wait and wait. So you know, they're they're frustrated. So it's not like an instant service. 
especially in hospitals. Look, they're already sick. Uh, when they go to hospital, if they uh, receive uh, French uh, uh, um, uh, instructions or whatever, what do you do? You know, they, uh, they, they're too tired, they're sick, you know, and yet they have to face this uh, difficulty. So anyway, that's uh, what I think. Thank you, Sean. Um, Jeanette, Jeanette, I, thank you Jeanette, very can much. Can you hear me? Can I, oh, uh, there's can I, can Ricardo. Is this yeah, Ricardo? Sorry. Uh, yes. I just, yeah, I just like you to don't... say a few words. Um, Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's we cannot see. A few you. words. We cannot oh, see. Okay. Well, that's okay. As long as you can hear me. We can okay. hear you. So, uh, yeah, I came in. I came in 1974, here in Canada, and I, I stayed in Montreal. Okay, and um, I'm a professional engineer in the Philippines, and the first thing I did was to get you know my uh, license to practice as an engineer here in Quebec. So I took all the requirements as required by the OEQ and I passed all the requirements. But one thing uh, which is new was the implementation of Bill 101 in 1976. So I studied hard, I learned the French uh, language I have a work, good working knowledge. And uh, so uh, I passed the French, uh, French test that was in 1976. So as required by the original Bill 101, okay? And I have my children also bilingual in French and in English as required by the original Bill 101. Now, uh, I'm looking at uh, the future of my grandchildren, okay? And I believe that uh, with the original Bill 101, we don't need the Bill 96 to continue further improving our French uh, language uh, knowledge. So uh, with the QCGN, uh, I'm really uh, very appreciative and in solid support of the efforts being undertaken. So thank you very much, QCGN. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Marcus, do you have a question? Uh, I want to look also to the future. Uh, Quebec, and it's been raised a number of times, is in competition with the rest of the world for immigration. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about how this might affect Filipino immigration into Quebec. We need, we need trained engineers, we need trained healthcare professionals, we need a good population who choose to come to Quebec. And what impact do you think Bill 96 might have on such immigration? Okay, yeah, that's one thing that I'd like to touch on. I'm, I came to Canada in 1980, and I was a medical technologist uh, working in the hospital there and a part-time secretary. I came to uh, Vancouver and then Regina. I, um, I worked at Saskatchewan Health, um, uh, Health Promotion Division, secretary to the uh, director of uh, Health Promotion Division. Uh, and, uh, and then I came to Canada, uh, to Montreal, and I couldn't uh, practice my medical technologies, uh, my degree. And I tried to um, get some information and they asked me to go back to CEGEP while mine was a um, Bachelor of Science degree. Okay, and I already have experiences. So um, what I did was I took nursing. So I became uh, a nurse and of course I had to take the French uh, test and which I passed. My husband, by the way, is. Uh, a Frenchman from Lyon, France. That's why you see my name, uh, Pirignon. Anyway, so I got that. And in the hospital, I was able to, to work uh, as a nurse, assistant uh, head nurse, the Lakeshore General Hospital. And uh, I saw that there's a lot of the Filipinos who were working there, who were new immigrants, and as a nurse in the Philippines, and they couldn't even get their nursing uh, um, status here. So they become uh, nursing or 
RNA, religious nursing auxiliary. And they have difficulty uh, with uh, administration who are only speaking French and they couldn't even understand. So I would become their translator. So it becomes, uh, you know, uh, quite a hindrance in their performing, in performing their, their duties. Now, um, uh, getting to your question, um, there's a lot of Filipinos who would like to come to Canada with a profession, like nurses, doctors, dentists, whatever. But because of the French uh, language, they cannot even come to Quebec. So what they do is they go to other provinces like Ontario. I have my two nieces who came in 2017 and they were accepted here in Quebec, but um, they didn't speak uh, French. And so I told them, go as an immigration, if you can go to Ontario. And uh, luckily they were able to, but you know, again, we need some new immigrants here in Quebec, but because of the, of the French language, they, you know, uh, we can uh, get the, the influx from the Philippines. There's loads and loads of those Filipinos are waiting to come here. But uh, again, they choose other provinces. So why? Because Quebec seem to only um, respect French. Thank you. I have a question along similar lines. You spoke really eloquently about the impact of language difficulties on seniors in the Filipino community. But we want, of course, we want seniors to come in for family reunification purposes, but we also want all those professionals that you're talking about who are in their prime working years and who could contribute so much to us. And the government offers, and I think is going to intensify, although I'm not sure about that, um, language training for newcomers, which presumably would help at least some of those people to some extent. But uh, buried in Bill 96, there's a provision that says something like, after six months, an immigrant will have to uh, accept public services in French, no longer in any other language. Is six months enough time to learn enough French to be able to function? Yeah, well, a very good question. Actually, I experienced that. Um, in 1995, uh, uh, I think 85, we moved here from Saskatchewan. So I was... Um, treated like an immigrant because I came from outside of Quebec. So I was um, offered this uh, free, uh, I think five and a half months uh, training or to uh, go to this conversational French. Okay? Because I knew only a very little French at the time though my husband is French. So I went there and it was good. But again, it depends on the person, on the ability of the person uh, to um, to absorb, you know, has the capability of learning a new language. Uh, I, for one, I'm I'm uh, I'm good at different language because I speak um, Tagalog, English, French, and uh, Spanish, and a bit of Italian. Okay, so but then I look at those other people, you know, who don't, uh, you know, they are not language uh, uh, savvy. So I would find it very difficult for them to learn within six months. Because after five and a half months for me, I was able to, to speak because I was lucky, had a Quebecois teacher and one Belgian teacher lady. Yeah. So very nice. And we did that impromptu thing uh, where they give us a subject and you, re you enact it. So that was a very, very good method. And even if you, uh, you don't have the vocabulary, just put a little bit of English on that, but you're able to communicate. So now, uh, people who don't have that uh, that skill in language, I find months is short um, because why? They are working at the same time and then they go to this uh, school to learn French. Their mind is just too, uh, too busy and plus uh, take care of their family and of course financial uh, status, they, they have to make ends meet. Uh, it's just six months too short, I think. Okay. I yeah. wonder if I could sneak in a question to Ricardo. Are you still there, Ricardo? Yeah, yes, I'm here. 
Okay. Um, Bill 96 says that members of professional orders who have already passed the French qualifications are going to have to re-demonstrate regularly that they still have mastery of French. Is that going to be a problem? That's really a good question. And uh, based on my experience since I passed the French test in 1977, and, uh, and I retired uh, some uh, uh, five years ago, I noticed that, you know, working and at the same time learning French is still, you know, a problem. It takes really time uh, to really have a good knowledge of the French language. Although uh, when I was working, we started in the company wherein I was working, uh, I was lucky because the, the company was a French company. So <clears throat> uh, we were already doing all the works, the contracts, the specifications started to be written in French. Okay. So I also traveled to all these pulp and paper mills all over Quebec. And I always <clears throat> make it a point that before we have a meeting, I let them know that, you know, I just started to learn in French. And uh, if I have a problem uh, speaking in French, I said, you just said, excuse me, but I have to uh, really speak in English. So they were really, the people were really very happy, you know, that I was doing efforts to learn the French, uh, the French language. But still, you know, with uh, the bill, 96, you know, I don't think, you know, we, we need the, B, the amendments in Bill 96, okay? Because it really takes time, really takes time. You have to really speak the, the language, even if you are very fluent in reading and understanding it, but the speaking again is a, really a big problem. So it's a matter of using the language, speaking it out to other people and that's the only way you can improve your uh, uh, French language. Thank you very much. Um, Marcus, Eleni, do you have any further questions? Not from Eleni and I think not from Marcus, no. Look, I want to thank you. We all want to thank you both so much. It's, um, it's really important to hear your perspective, the perspective of a thriving community of immigrants face à uh, the, the uh, current situation in Quebec. And we're very grateful to you for having taken the time to be with us in spite of computer problems. Yeah. So thank you, thank you both very much indeed. Oh, well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joan. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks to the panelists. Yeah. Um, our next uh, panelist will be Shaheen Ashraf from the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. Ms. Ashraf is a Montrealer who was born in Pakistan and came to Canada in September of 1976 with four young children. The Canadian Council of Muslim Women, CCMW, is a national not-for-profit organization committed to attaining equality, equity, and empowerment for all Muslim women in Canada. Founded in 1982, the organization works to promote Muslim women's identity in the Canadian context. Okay. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, distingués conférenciers. Permettez-moi de parler en anglais aujourd'hui, seulement parce que je peux m'exprimer mieux en anglais qu'en français. Respectfully, je comprends plus mieux que je peux parler. Thank you to QCGN for giving me the opportunity to express my feelings and speak to you today about Bill 96 on behalf of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, Montreal chapter. We are a long-standing chapter of the national organization CCMW and we contribute to Quebec society regularly and try our best to address women's needs regardless of language, culture, or religion. 
I want to share our concerns about this discriminatory bill because this bill, which is supposed to be an act representing um, respecting French as the only official and common language of Quebec, piques our concerns surrounding the impacts that it will have on women from diverse cultural backgrounds with first languages that are other than French, meaning allophones or anglophones. Their access to public services, access to gainful employment of their choice, um, already the Bill 21 impacts them, uh, access to justice, and protection of their basic human rights will be impacted. Some of our elders of our community who have had their education um, in English in their mother countries have difficulty in learning new languages. We all know that after a certain age, it is difficult to learn a new language. These seniors will be most vulnerable to this bill if it becomes a legislation. Bill 96 will definitely reduce access to public services in English and limit eligibility for them. It will give the majority French speaking municipalities power to refuse to communicate with individuals in English. Imagine not being able to receive a tax bill in English if that is what we require. By our estimates, this bill will create second-class citizens and people would receive unfair treatment on account of what language they speak. It also has no semblance of equality and is a very disempowering legislation. We all know the well-researched fact that women, and especially those from racialized communities, already face systemic barriers when applying for jobs, board positions, and more. We believe Bill 96 will have the power to deprive newcomer women possessing highly educational backgrounds to settle for less due to discrimination indirectly caused by this legislation. This bill will restrict access to justice as it states that non-French speaking Quebecers would be obliged to attach certified French translations to legal proceedings at the litigant's expense. This makes accessing Quebec courtrooms more complicated and costly for non-French speaking Quebecers. We strongly believe this will disproportionately impact women and those from underrepresented communities. It is already a documented fact that women often face distinctive social and institutional barriers to accessing justice and finding suitable solutions to their legal problems due to gender discrimination, social stigmas, lack of knowledge of their rights, as well as economic and educational um, barriers, disadvantages also. Equal access to the judicial system is the cornerstone of a healthy democratic society. This bill seems to stand in direct opposition of this value. It is troubling that this legislation will not be safeguarding individual rights because it recognizes the sovereignty of the French language over the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and over Quebec's own Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. This effectively makes Quebec a charter-free zone. It appears that this is another attempt of our uh, provincial government to disregard individual rights by using the notwithstanding clause to strengthen Francophone rights at the expense of everyone else. Bill 21, as we all know, the bill banning symbols, religious symbols, was the first time in Quebec's history that the notwithstanding clause had been used to suspend all provisions in both the Canadian and Quebec charters. Bill 96 seems to be the second one now. Usually diversity is seen as a strength that gives us, all of us, a, a winning position. Everyone, regardless of background, is able to find their place, share the load, 
and contribute willingly to Quebec society. However, this bill seems to penalize English speaking Quebecers and create a different class of citizens within Quebec. We totally understand the importance of safeguarding the French language. However, punishing one group for not speaking the language will not promote the use of French or encourage individuals to embrace the language. We believe this bill will have the power to drive a wedge between Quebecers and create divisions and discord in society. Finally, while most leaders around the world are working towards strengthening women's access to justice, it is very concerning that we are seeming, seeing the opposite from our Quebec's provincial government. Barriers to justice placed by the ruling powers is something you would not expect from a provincial government in Canada. Preserving the French language does not require suspending others' human rights. We ask you to please reconsider Bill 96. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and now we will have, of course, some questions for you. Um, Eleni. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Ian, for uh, bringing also the perspective of obviously women and also access to, um, to justice, which is a, an important pillar of, our, of a democratic society. So I appreciate your comments. Um, considering the fact that uh, Bill 21, which directly affects members of your community, has started to go through the court system, and we know what the first ruling uh, said, and I won't repeat. Uh, uh, do you feel that, um, sorry, it's clear that Bill 96 will probably be adopted by the National Assembly. Do you feel uh, the best way to uh, proceed in terms of making sure that the barriers that you said to justice are not there is that we proceed again, or not us personally, but uh, a, a group or others uh, in the legal community proceed through the judicial system to be able to uh, make sure that the uh, access to justice for everyone is respected. Yes, of course, definitely we need uh, justice and, and we need to be able to, uh, to, to access for, for just because of, you know, like our, our problems are, are the same. Women face discrimination, we all know that. Uh, there, there is, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be the Muslim community, it doesn't have to be the Filipino community or any community, but women as genders have been discriminated against. And um, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, but we, we need justice uh, and uh, we need to be able to choose our language. We need to be able to choose the way we dress. We need to be able to, to feel free, you know, we, by, by putting these impositions on, on women and in, in particular Muslim women, language, clothes, how you dress, you know, like uh, soon it'll be what you eat or what you drink. And, and you know, I don't think that the government has the right to, 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 to declare what we wear. You know, like uh, this is like some countries in the Middle East that, that impose on you that you have to cover, you cannot go out of the house without being covered. So it's exactly the same concept that we need to take our covers off when we, when we, we, we choose the, the profession of our choice. You know, so it's, it's, it's limiting the, the women, it's restricting their, their choices. Uh, can I have a follow-up question very quickly, Joan? Of course. Um, are you hearing in the community that, um, that women themselves have decided that they will no longer uh, stay in, in Quebec because they feel that they're limited in terms of their access to employment, their access to services? Um, I know there has been some discussion in, in the media about after Bill 21 about some professionals leaving, leaving Quebec and what a loss it would be for all of us. 
yeah. uh, if I may say so as a commentary. Yeah. So are you hearing more and more that, that they feel that they have to go elsewhere in Canada to be able to seek uh, employment? Absolutely, absolutely. Many, many people I know have, have left. Many people I know have left already. Uh, there was a language barrier. Then now the Bill 21 was the clothes barrier. You know, your wardrobe has to be changed because, um, and, and you know, people put, put, people dress according to choice. They, nobody imposes anything on it. Yes, you might have 1% people imposing on their women folk to, to dress a certain way, but 99% uh, of women choose to dress the way they, they feel comfortable. I mean, dress is, is what you feel comfortable in, you know, so. Yeah, and, and thank you so much. Because, uh, you know, like money counts, right? You need to feed your family, you need to put food on the table. And if you're not going to give me a job, I will definitely look elsewhere. Thank you, Shaheen. Marcus, John. do you have a question? I'd like to follow up on that, uh, on that thought. Where, where I live on the West Island of Montreal, the Muslim community is a thriving community. It's a growing community and has added much to the life of the West Island in the last number of years. You say when people with Bill 96 are going to have to settle for less, not just women, but the families in general will have to settle for less. What do you see as the prospect for the future of immigration to Quebec by the Muslim community? You know, um, the uh, West Africa, the continent of West Africa, um, um, people over there because they were colonized by the French, uh, speak French. So it's okay for them to come here. But where I come from, further east, um, the, uh, my education was in English. So I'm more comfortable speaking to you in English. And many of the, my community, they settle in Ontario because Ontario is much more friendly uh, towards uh, other communities than Quebec. So they choose to go there and you should see how they're flourishing over there in Ontario. You know, like they all have good jobs. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're doing very well. So you're right, uh, Marcus, that uh, we will suffer over here we will lose some talent because of this language barrier, you know? So I don't understand um, why language is so important because, you know, your culture, your language and your culture, those are the two things that no one can take away from you, okay? So uh, this fear, Sometimes I, sometimes I feel that maybe the government just wants to put this fear in the, in the, in the population so that it needs to, to, to divide them so that they can control them. That, that is my personal understanding of, of this whole, um, how, how, how shall I put it, this whole halabaloo. Can I use that language, halabaloo, <laughs> that every few days uh, uh, something comes up. I mean, I've been fighting this kind of a thing ever since uh, 2011 or 2012, something like that, since the days of Pauline Marois, you know? So I, I don't know, it, it keeps That's getting awesome. worse and worse. I mean, at my age, I'm retired, but I'm not gonna move. I'll suffer over here. But all the young people who don't want to speak French will move. My children are thoroughly bilingual. They speak French because they grew up here. But, you know, I was too busy raising my family that uh, I, I didn't have time to, to brush up my French, you know. And, and also, I feel I was in a profession because I was, um, my business was um, uh, the shipping business. And even in, in France, they speak English and the, the, the language of shipping is, is, is English, okay. So I never got the opportunity to, to brush my French because uh, I didn't get the practice, but then I'm being penalized for that. Yeah, so. Just a very quick follow-up uh, com comment more than anything. A couple of years ago, I attended an event from the Canadian Muslim Federation and they went to great lengths to make sure that the event was held in French, English and, and other languages. And I just find it so distressing that that's not been recognized and really celebrated rather than looked down upon. I agree with you 100% because I respect 
all languages, not just French. I respect all languages. Language is a very, very personal thing. It's very dear to you, okay? My mother tongue is Urdu, and so Urdu is very, very dear to me. My education was in English, so English is also dear, dear to me. I live in, in Quebec, so French is dear to me. I, I, I uh, read my, my holy book in Arabic, so Arabic is dear to me. So, I mean, the more languages you speak, the more languages you know, the... the the more open your mind is and, and the more accepting you are of people. If you're just going to learn French, um, you're not going to be able to understand me. You're not going to be able to see what's happening around the world. You know, so, I mean, it's very basic. I don't know. I mean, and people, the government has to realize this, okay? God forbid, if somebody else in power wants to impose only one kind of language over them, how would they feel? Sometimes you've got to step into the shoes of the other to, 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 to feel how they are feeling, to be able to judge properly, to be able to legislate properly, you know? So I don't know. Okay, Marcus. Yeah. Um, if I may ask a question myself. Sure. Um, in terms of the blanket use of notwithstanding clauses, Bill 21 was uh, a bit of a dress rehearsal, if you will, for what we now see with Bill 96. So I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how relations between minorities, your minority, the Muslim minority, and particularly Muslim women, how relations between these minorities and the majority population in Quebec have changed since the adoption of Bill 21, or have they changed? You know, um, this, is, this is a very good question, and, and I, I wanted to tell you this. Um, I always say that this fear is because you do not know me. Try and stretch your hand out. Reach out to me and see who I am. You know, get to know me. And then realize that we are no different language or no language, you know? And, and, and sign language is the best language of all, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the, you know, it, it is just very distressing that you are singled out because of the way you dress. You know, um, in the days of Pauline Marois, Ontario had this slogan. Um, they had made this big poster about about a woman who had the scarf on, and um, and they said, "Come to us because we care what's inside your head, not over your head." And this was this was a huge thing uh, during the Pauline Marois days. Okay, so uh, and and it's. You know, every few days this pops up, these the women's, I, I wonder when they are going to um, stop uh, focusing on how women dress, you know, so, and, and, and see what they can produce and how they can contribute to Quebec society. I, I have French speaking friends, uh, I have French, French uh, uh, friends, and, and they're against this, you know, so. Mm. When when you're out in public shopping or whatever, you you're wearing a scarf. Yes, I assume. Yes. Yes. Do you find, do you sense any um, hostility or suspicion or discrimination of any kind? I, I will tell you this. As Marcus said, I live in the West Island, and West Island is, is mostly English speaking. And also, I have to tell you that I have been extremely lucky since I came to Canada in 1976. I've been extremely lucky. There were hardly one or two instances when I felt, um, oh, it's because of my scarf. Of course, I, I, I started wearing my scarf in 1997 uh, after my pilgrimage, after my Hajj. Uh, before that, I was just uh, uh, normally dressed in the sense of Quebec normal, mm. you know, uh, without a headscarf. So, uh, and I, you know, I have heard horror stories, but I have been extremely lucky that I have not been discriminated against, okay, because of my dress. But only in my 47 years, maybe four times, I have felt that, you know, and of course, when 9-11 happened, I was yeah. petrified. 
I was petrified. And so. But it speaks well of, of you, but also of the society in which you live, that you personally, at any rate, have been spared largely the kind Praise of discrimination that people fear. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I have been spared. But I have heard horror stories, especially from, I think it's because my, of my age, I have been uh, uh, protected because people respect me. And, um, and, and, and I also have to tell you that I don't discriminate against anyone. So uh, I think it's, it's the vibes one puts out, sometimes fear. If I, it's like this, you know, animals sense your fear. If you fear them, they will attack you. And, and I think humans are the same. If, if I fear, because I don't fear them. I don't fear them. Mm -hmm. If somebody is going to be to discriminate against me, I will engage them. Okay, I will engage them. And, and so many times I've said it on TV. I have been interviewed on TV. I've said it on TV because the interviewer asked me this question. Um, this was um, when Bill 21 was becoming legislation. And um, I was on CTV and, and, the, and the interviewer asked me, um, what would you like to say to uh, uh, Premier Legault? And I said, I would like to invite him to speak to him, to educate him that we are no different. You know, we only dress differently. We are the same human beings. I always use this analogy. You cut my finger and I cut your finger and we see both our blood will be red color. Okay, so we're all the same. We look different. We, we behave differently, but we're all the same inside, you know? So this legislation, this, oh, I don't, I shouldn't call it legislation, this bill, this bill is, is, is very discriminatory. Okay. Any other questions, any, Marcus? Uh, you have been most eloquent. We thank you very much, thank you so much. indeed. Thank you so much. And it's, it's been very having... helpful and instructive for us. Thank you so for having me. And colleagues, our next guests are Vanessa Herrick and Walter Dushara. I hope I am pronouncing that. And if not, I stand to be corrected. Um, they are two longtime community volunteers who are representing Seniors Action Quebec, which works to maintain and whoops, where's my cheat sheet? Guy? Maintain and enhance the vitality of English speaking Quebec seniors. They will reflect on the challenges Bill 96 presents for our seniors. Now, Vanessa and Walter, are you there? There's Vanessa. Can you see me? And there's Walter. Now, how should I pronounce your name, sir? You did it right. Oh, gee, that's great. Okay, well, the floor is yours. I don't know which of you wants to go first. Ladies first. Ladies uh, first. Such a gentleman. <laughs> so I want to thank QCGN for having us. Um, I think it's important that this part of society be given the chance to speak out as Bill 96 obviously is going to impact seniors. And I want to thank those who spoke before me from different communities who also emphasized um, the particular risks that immigrant seniors are going to face or people from different cultures are going to face under Bill 96. Um, seniors Action Quebec basically works to represent English speaking seniors in Quebec and that's almost 300,000 people. Um, so many of the things that we're going to speak to will hopefully echo from what's been said by others and hopefully add strength to what I think we can all you know, identify as shared concerns. Um, but one of the, I'm, I'm going to let Walter introduce himself and then I'll probably start talking again. <laughs> okay, Walter. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, our, our presentation will be a little bit different from the others, I think, uh, in the sense that we don't have a brief, but we have a story. And uh, the story will be the story of a senior, i.e. me, uh, as one of the people who, uh, who's lived in this province for 72 out of my 74 years. Um, and uh, we, will, we have a number of points that we're going to raise, but uh, we'll interlace uh, the, the points 
the content points with, uh, with part of my story. So here we go. Um, as I said, 72 of my 74 years have been spent in Quebec. I have four children <clears throat> born here. I have five grandchildren. And now I'm faced with the question of, am I a Quebecer? This is ridiculous. I know the answer to that, but others seem to be asking that question. I feel very disappointed in our government. Uh, and I feel uh, particularly sometimes angered by our government for hiding behind the pandemic and pushing Bill 96 through uh, at a time where there is no public discussion and many people have many other things on their minds. I believe that the putting aside of the constitution, constitutional guarantees and Quebec's uh, charter is a cynical legislative slate of hand and they need to be called out on it. Um, and I, I think that as we go through the points that, that we're raising here, I think that we should remember that everything impacts us as people. This is not a, a, a discussion that is theoretical. It's not a debate uh, that is between legislators. It's not a debate that is between politicians. It is a law that will be passed, that may be passed, that will have an impact that is direct, immediate, and harmful to a significant proportion of Quebec's population. Vanessa, back to you. Thanks, Walter. And yeah, I think it's really important, Walter's point that um, many of the things that we're looking at this bill from a very analytical point of view, but this is going to impact people. Um, and there are so many stories that we hear, people who work with the community, um, that highlight why seniors are particularly at risk. And I'm going to go into one of those that I think is extremely important. English speaking seniors in Quebec, uh, many of them are less bilingual than younger generations. They did not go to school under Bill 101. Many were busy raising their children, did not have the opportunity in their workplace to work on and improve their French. Um, so we're looking at a percentage of the population who are already off the top at higher risk of facing struggles should or when Bill 96 comes in. I think that it should also be said and is really important that English speaking seniors in Quebec are a huge part of the reason that our younger generations are bilingual. They are the ones who chose to send their children to French immersion courses or to French school. I went to French school. That was the choice of my parents. And I think that that recognition of that contribution to Quebec has somehow been lost as well and is extremely important. English speaking seniors have long been allies of protecting the French language and they are not being treated that way. Yep. Bill 96, in, in my opinion, is a, um... Uh, I hate to say this, but I believe it's a constitutional IED wrapped up in silver paper. Uh, we don't know the effect it will have. Uh, I've listened to the presentations earlier, especially by Michael Bergman. The, the impact of this bill uh, could be horrendous down the road. We don't know. But what we do know is that at this point in time and throughout the journey in my life, uh, I have experienced uh, reductions in my, in my rights. I've experienced uh, difficulties and challenges. Uh, I've met people who've had greater challenges than I have. Let me say, just say two words about my professional life. I spent 40 years in education, about half of it in the educational system as teacher, uh, principal, director general of a school board, and a half in the Ministry of Education as a specialist as a uh, deputy director and acting director of English educational services in the Ministry of Education, and as an advisor, a special advisor, conseiller cadre uh, to the Ministry of Education. I've been through virtually every part of Quebec. Uh, I had the most wonderful French speaking colleagues uh, that I interacted with. But every now and again, I was taken aback by certain things that, that were missed that they didn't seem to, they didn't seem to see, they didn't seem to click into. Um, and, you know, they, they, it's, it's the parts that, that are missed that I think surface in the kind of discussions and conversations that we're having now around Bill 96. 
Um, as we as we move forward in our in our lives, uh, we 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 put our faith into a certain process. Um, I was there when Randy Lebec uh, spoke at that uh, that large assembly. I was there. Uh, sitting with uh, uh, Claude, not Claude Ryan, uh, sitting with uh, Camille Lorrain as he was speaking to an immigrant group, the Ukrainian group, telling us that, uh, you know what, you'll be fine. Uh, and actually, we don't really have to listen to you because you really don't count down the road anyway. Uh, I was afraid walking past mailboxes when I was going to and from school. Uh, I saw the army out in the streets parked in front of the, the home of a uh, member of parliament in my neighborhood. You know, these are things that they have an impact on you. And these are not things that I want my children and grandchildren to experience down the road. This is, and we, we had a contract, a compact with the government of Quebec that said, Bill 21 will impose things on you, fine. We fought that and we got into some kind of a peaceful arrangement and, and we worked our way through. And then there was, let's go back to open this up and let's go back and open that up. It's kind of we're, we're, being, we're being moved into onto this nationalist agenda piecemeal over the years. Uh, and as we feel that we have closed the chapter, a new one opens up. And Bill 96 is just another iteration of that, uh, that kind of progress going forward. Vanessa. One of the other issues that I think it's important that is kept in mind when we look at the potential risk to seniors directly, specifically under Bill 96, is going to be under um, housing residences, which is unfortunately an area where Quebec has already failed our seniors miserably. Um, but if Bill 96 goes through as it is, the use of French within businesses, institutions, government institutions is going to be amplified. And therefore we already have English speaking seniors in residences who struggle because they don't speak French. However, they get by on the goodwill of people who are trying and doing their best. Many of them don't speak great English, but they'll try. And now we're in a situation where perhaps those people are going to be put at professional risk for trying to extend goodwill and support and provide good care and do all the things that these people were hired to do are meant to do. There are, of course, a few exceptions, but in general, people who work in the healthcare system are there because they wish to provide health care. They don't care what language you speak. And I would be astounded to find even the most extreme nationalist in Quebec who feels comfortable with the idea that English speaking seniors are denied health care or are feeling most isolated in seniors residences just because they're English. This is not the goal of protecting French culture. I mean, it's been said by people already this morning that Bill 96 doesn't even protect French. But I mean, if you're looking in a situation where Bill 96 increases isolation for English speaking seniors, where Bill 96 denies them the right of proper information for a diagnosis. I mean, imagine an English speaking senior with their doctor and their doctor has to speak French to them. And the only word they understand from what they're being told is cancer, because that's a word that's the same in French and English. That can't sit well with people. And so I think really it's extremely important that we think about our most vulnerable and that we think about real life situations. This isn't a theoretical argument. This isn't philosophy. This is people's day-to-day -day lives and their health. And as has been pointed out by others, life and death situations. As a case in point, um, my mother who passed away some 10 years ago uh, in her final years became completely dependent and uh, she had to leave her home and she had to leave her home by, by ambulance. Uh, so she was brought to a hospital in the, in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, the only place that they could put her was a ward uh, somewhere in the hospital where you had people who were basically in their last days. So she spent three months in the hospital ward before she was transferred to the Grey Start uh, CHSLV three months surrounded by people who did not speak English and she did not speak French. It was a terrible situation to look through. What will happen going forward if there are going to be more restrictions? 
uh, on people being able to use the English language in different circumstances. Uh, people on whom you rely because you are totally dependent on them, who will now be able to uh, kind of, if you annoy them or if you um, aggravate them in some way, uh, they could hide behind a smirk and say, well, really, I don't have to serve you in English. You know, I, I can serve you in French. That's just not right. Uh, and, and this, you know, th these are the kinds of things that happen every day. Uh, in the last few years before the pandemic, uh, I was part of a group of volunteers, retired people, actually Ukrainian retired people, about 30 of us. And every month we would go to old age homes to sing to the people who were there. You need to spend a day in an old age home. You need to spend a day in a CHSLD. You need to spend time in a hospital. A hospital bed is a great equalizer. You need to see these things. When you read this law, look at what's happening on the ground. Vanessa. This law is going to allow for, it's going to empower those who wish to create the division that's been referred to by people before us. And unfortunately, that division is going to mean that the most vulnerable, those who most need the government's protection, are going to fall under the most oppression. Um, Quebec has seen some of their darkest days for seniors in the recent months. I think everyone here would agree with that. And I think everyone in the National Assembly would agree with that. And so it's shocking and even more horrifying that at this time in Quebec's dark history with relationship with seniors, that they would push something through that's going to enforce that now even smaller private residences, CHSLDs are going to be speaking English, uh, sorry, speaking French because they have to. If a doctor decides to speak English, they're putting themselves at risk is some, I mean, at what point is the government going to start pursuing this? They're going to go after our physicians for trying to give proper care. It sounds absurd, it really does. However, this bill could make those situations possible. And even further to that, this bill could make it so that these language police have the right to enter these environments without any sort of um, police warrant that they can take your private computers. I mean, it may sound a little bit extreme, but these are scenarios that could be permitted. Um, and that's alarming. That's terrifying to seniors, but I should it should be terrifying to everybody. Um, there are things in this law that definitely need to be clarified. There are things in this law that need to be examined, challenged, and I hope that that is the first one to fall. Walter. We're all taxpayers in this province. We all pay for the services that we have. And I find it abhorrent that a certain pop part of the population will have to carry some kind of identification, a certificate of eligibility for English services. I find that abhorrent. Uh, you know, this is ridiculous to have that in this province in this day and age. And yet here it is, uh, couched in some language that we haven't been able to figure out yet, but there's some reference to some kind of document that you will have to have in order to be able to get an exemption and, and get services uh, offered to you in English. The, impact that it may have on seniors going forward in the judicial area is also very disturbing. Um, you know, if you have to have your will translated into French, uh, if you have to deal with a, an attorney or, or a, uh, uh, a notary uh, to, to draw up your papers, if you have to, uh, you know, give your consent uh, for some sort of medical treatment or medical intervention, if you want to give your consent for uh, 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 actions to end your life because of some illness. How do you do all of this stuff if somebody can kind of require you to do it in French? Uh, you know, where is the information going to come from going forward if anything coming from the bureaucracy of the government is going to be in French only? And if the, the onus of translation and understanding is with the individual, this just doesn't make sense uh, in, in, a, in a democratic society. Vanessa? Yeah, just to echo what Walter was saying about um, another major concern. I mean, really, the list is, <laughs> we could be here for hours. Um, but this idea that communication will only be 
well, legal communication will only happen in French. Um, communication from the government will only happen in French. Um, perhaps if you're one of these certified people, um, when it would be great to get some clarity on what that means, because if it does go the route of certification through the educational system, that will exclude, of course, the vast majority of seniors. And so they will not be considered English speakers. And so will they be allowed to have access? People who have been educated in other parts of the world will not have this famous English certificate. I mean, it, there's so many questions, um, but I cannot state strongly enough how important it is that we are able to communicate with our government in a language that makes information clear. We're talking about things such as your personal taxes. We're talking about legal issues. Um, and having to have everything in French when somebody's first language is not French is going to put an onus on English speaking seniors. Perhaps they won't read letters that come to them in French, um, which means they could be missing out on extremely important information. They could decide to not respond to things because they would have to go have things translated, which is not necessarily something that's simple and easy to do. It's just creating more and more barriers for a community that already has contributed decades of their lives to building a stronger, more vibrant Quebec and are being treated less and less like citizens. The thing that scares me most uh, for myself and, and for others is um, as we get older and when we are more dependent on uh, the services and, and the, uh, the kind of support that we need, that support can be withheld. You know, the government has taken away certain rights and privileges, and now they're taking away human dignity. You know, this is going too far. It's just going too far. This bill cannot be in any way embraced, supported, uh, allowed to move forward. It's just going too far. So I think, I think we've covered all the points that we wanted to cover. Walter, is there anything you want to wrap up with that hasn't already been said? No, I think uh, maybe there are some questions we can deal with those. Thank you both very much. Um, Eleni, do you have well, a thank question? You. Yes, I do, Joan. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know oh, where to begin. Uh, uh, sorry. May I just interrupt? for a point of clarification. Walter, earlier you made a reference to Bill 21. Were you talking about Bill 22? Uh, no. The first Barasa government's language bill? In Bill 22, but I also have my concerns with Bill 21. Yeah, but in, in that context, you were yes. talking about the evolution of Yes, language. that's right. Okay, Sorry, forgive me. Thank you very much. Eleni. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, I don't know where to begin because we've heard, uh, I thank you both, first of all, Vanessa and Walter. Uh, and uh, having two uh, parents over 90 years old whose first language was uh, Greek, not English and French. Um, obviously, I'm their translator every time they have to use the uh, health system or any other services in this government. So it worries me greatly that they've spent 60 years in Canada and uh, will now be denied certain fundamental rights. But we heard testimony from other organizations that those who will be impacted most by Bill 96 are the most vulnerable. We heard about the indigenous, the homeless uh, youth in the uh, youth protection system, women, uh, battered women who need to use the judicial system, and now the most vulnerable in our societies and the pandemic uh, seniors, our seniors, who have contributed also much to make this society better for the rest of us. Um, we know that the government is uh, determined to adopt this legislation. And uh, we, as you know, the QCGN will be presenting a brief and we will attach all the uh, briefs that were presented at these public consultations. But there is there, if, if you were to make one recommendation in terms of a major change uh, to the legislation, uh, what would be your main recommendation for the seniors, specifically for the seniors? I think it would be really difficult to narrow it down to one. 
um, for myself, and I'll let Walter answer because we, we may have different ideas. For myself, I would say that the number one priority um, would be creating an exception around healthcare, access to healthcare, social services, in particular in seniors' residences. We have so much work to do to improve uh, the quality of lives of our seniors. And I think denying them access to health and social services is unforgivable um, and absolutely needs to be reviewed. Walter? Thank you. I think uh, there are two things. I think number one, uh, as I've heard others say earlier today and yesterday and the day before, uh, this bill is not about the French language exclusively. There's, there's, uh, there's so much more uh, hidden behind that uh, veneer of the French language situation. So that has to be, you know, that has to be said loud and clear. French is not under threat. I mean, you know, we, we set up second language uh, education in our school system from the 1970s onwards. You know, who did that? That didn't come from government. It came from parents. It came from us. You know, uh, my kids are all bilingual. My grandchildren are bilingual. And I'm trying to keep them all trilingual, in fact. You know, th this is not a language issue. This is a, an issue that is, that is beyond that and that sometimes I have difficulty comprehending. It seems to be uh, some kind of, I don't know, punishment uh, that needs to be inflicted over time uh, from one generation to the next. It just does not make sense in a, in a modern democratic society to have, to experience the kind of thing that we're experiencing. Um, the, the, as citizens, regardless of what language you speak, regardless of where we came from, when we got here, we should be able to access all of the services in, with the, the abilities that we have, the capacities that we have, and our government should respond to the needs of its population. This is not what's happening in this bill. This is revoking certain services from certain parts, parts of the population and benefiting who? I don't know. It's, it, it's just a, uh, uh, in my opinion, it's just a bad bill altogether. And, uh, you know, somebody is being a little bit too clever by half with push, uh, pushing this thing through. And it needs to be stopped uh, as a bill. It needs, you know, even if you fail, even if you fail, I think you should say this bill is not good. This is not a proper bill. It should not be passed, you know, and people will be held to account by history. In, in, in the face of uh, the adoption of this bill. And I think that might be the, uh, you know, the, 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 the best outcome that we can have. You can lose a battle, but maybe you'll win the war. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Vanessa. Marcus, do you have a question? I don't know if it's a question or, or comment, but we're not gonna have to wait for Bill 96 to be adopted in whatever form. Um, I have recently had uh, my experiences with the healthcare system. Uh, the, the person who called me to confirm my appointments uh, spoke to me in French and told me I don't have to speak English. Uh, you know, I, I will, but I don't have to anymore. And even even yesterday uh, in in pre-op, all of the medical questions that uh, they were asking me were asked in French. And luckily I could answer most, but even when I answered in English, because I guess one of my failings as a 71 year old Quebecer is that my medical vocabulary is not, maybe not what it needs to be. Um, even then I was told that, you know, you're going to have to be able to do this in French at some point. I, I, I'm concerned as you are, as both of you are about the healthcare system. I agree that there, I don't believe there's any way to fix uh, that part of the bill, uh, uh, or any of the bill, quite frankly. But Walter, with your background in the education system, what part will the education or can the education system play in helping seniors, um, helping Quebecers who need it, to learn to be able to live uh, and access services in, uh, in Quebec uh, down the road? You know, um, when, when I was working for the Ministry of Education, there was a period of time I was working at the, uh, the level of the deputy ministers at, at the BSM. And this was back in the 80s. And at that time, I was telling them, what you need to do is open up French second language education to everyone. 
You know, my mother should be able to take a French course and it shouldn't be an obstacle. If you really want to do something about French and you really want people to embrace the, the culture and, and French society, make it easy for them. Uh, they haven't done that. Recently, I heard Mr. Skeet saying something, you know, this law will give us access to French. Oh, that's nice. You know, it's 60 years late, you know, um, but that's something that they can do. The second thing that they can do is they can open up some of the understandings that, that, uh, that are shared with children to include the broader world. You know, the, the, uh, the history of Quebec and Canada, I, I don't even think that exists anymore. The history courses that, that children have is too restricted. It doesn't give them a chance to see what's happening really, and not only uh, in Quebec, because there's so much uh, of the participation of English speaking and other immigrant communities that's missing and the, the, uh, the indigenous communities that's missing in our history program, there's the rest of Canada that's missing. Uh, you know, this is wrong. Uh, people should not have a sense that they live in a small bubble called Quebec that is being under threat, uh, threatened by the rest of the world all the time. And especially, you know, uh, Canada is not a good place. This is the wrong message. We need to be able to confront them and say, no, this is not something that should be done. As parents, we object. Everywhere I went in Quebec over the, the 20 years I was working for the ministry, I would meet parents in the French communities and they say, you're so lucky that you can send your kids to English schools. We want to send our kids to English schools, but the government, whoever that is, uh, won't let us. And I would say to them, you are the government. You elected these people. If you want to have access to English schools, tell these people to do that. You know, elect those that will support that plan. You know, don't complain about it. Do something about it. And, and this is the, 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 uh, the kind of uh, mentality that people have where they, they sort of give up. You know, they say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's them. It's not us. It is us. And, you know, we're in the same position right now, you know, as an English speaking community. We have to tell this government and it's just this government. You know, they, they got whatever votes they got. And they're going to be here or gone in the next couple of years. It doesn't matter. But this government is not speaking for us. This government, this law is not responding to our needs. We need to say to them, this is wrong. You've got, you're on the wrong path. They may not listen. It doesn't matter. But we have to tell them that. In education, same thing. We have to tell the truth. We have to tell the facts. We have to tell people what's going on. We don't have to tell them what somebody else tells us to tell them. And that's been the case for too long, in my opinion. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm going to sneak in with a question on a, a lower level, uh, if I may. Uh, unfortunately, as the population ages, so does the uh, incidence of dementia. Am I correct in my sense that in many, many cases, if not all of dementia, as it progresses and begins to affect language capability, that you lose languages progressively, languages other than your mother tongue. Is that, am I right about that? I'm not a medical person. I'm not a medical person either, but uh, in, in, in my experience and what I've heard, uh, are people talking about that seems to be the case. Uh, I can I can say that uh, in in the uh, the volunteer work that I've done in old age homes, uh, the folks who are there uh, as they get older and as they uh, they begin to to lose some of their capacities, they certainly do revert back to their language, their mother tongue, the language of origin, and uh, some people who who basically are not present in quotation marks, who, who don't participate, when they hear when they hear their mother tongue. When they hear their songs in mother tongue, they light up. Yeah. They come alive. Yeah. You know, for 30 seconds, two minutes. Mm -hmm. You need to see that. Yeah, uh, so this discussion of, of even if you've spent your whole adult life participating fully in, in a language that is not your mother tongue, um, toward the end, 
it may get harder. Um, that would tend to reinforce the point about special provisions, perhaps special exemptions being needed for seniors, uh, for people with various health problems. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think it needs to be reiterated um, that, as I said before, and, and I think many people will be saying during these hearings, this is not a political discussion. This is not a philosophical discussion. This is a discussion of quality of life of human beings. And the reality of how that impacts may look different in different parts of our community, but it is going to impact the quality of life of our most vulnerable. And that's not to be denied. You have dozens of people coming on here giving different perspectives on that. And I don't think that will sit well with Quebecers who, who may think that this bill on paper doesn't look like a big deal. So you have to translate a few documents into French, whatever. That isn't what this is about at all. And so I think that you know, allowing people to tell these stories and allowing people to share the, the reality of the impact of this kind of legislation um, is really critical. So thank you again to QCGN for letting us come on and share. You know, we're very uh, grateful to you. Yes. Yeah. This this emperor has no clothes, and somebody <laughs> has to call him out on it. Okay, that's that's a good line, a good getaway line. Thank you both so very thank much. Um, these hearings are bringing so many important perspectives to us, and you've made one of the most important perspectives uh, clearer to us today. Thank you both very, very much. And we will move therefore to our next speaker, who is Aki Chitakov of YES. YES provides innovative and comprehensive services to help Quebecers find sustainable careers within the province. YES is committed to helping English speaking Quebecers find work and Aki will be addressing the impact of Bill 96 on the job market. Aki, I understand you are there. Hello. Hi, there he hi is. Senator Fraser. Hello. Thank you. Hi. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, uh, yes, uh, my name is Aki Chitakov. I'm executive director of Yes Employment and Entrepreneurship, uh, an organization that I'm hoping most of you have heard of. And I hope uh, some of you, your families, and your young people have used our services because that's what we're there for. I'd like to start by thanking uh, the QCGN for this initiative. I think it's so important to be doing this at this time when things seem to be a little bit uh, in, in a fog in the sense that uh, Bill 96 is still only a bill. It's not, uh, it's not the law in Quebec just yet. Uh, most of our community from what I could see are not really tuning in. So it's so important for us to be to be uh, doing a consultation like this and to have this level of participation and to be able to uh, sound the alarm and uh, really uh, let our community know uh, what's at stake here. I believe uh, that we, we submitted uh, we, uh, our document. Uh, you do have it, I, I presume, and you, you have had a chance to look at it because I don't want to read the document that we already presented to the committee. So uh, what I'd like to do is basically supplement uh, some of the points uh, that we raised. And I'd like to just start by saying that like, like most of you, I am a, a, um, a, a, I guess from the generation of the 1980s during the, uh, the intense uh, language uh, issues that, that we were facing. And of course, uh, the unity crisis that we were, that we were facing. And I, and of course, like most of us, uh, we could be forgiven for thinking that, uh, that that was all behind us. And now for this gen generation, our kids, they won't have to, to face you know, the, the types of stress and the, and the types of, uh, the types of uh, worries that we had to deal with when we were graduating from university. But alas, uh, it looks like that uh, some of that unfortunately might be returning, but we hope not. Um, YES was established um, to deal with the exodus of, uh, of young English speakers uh, in the time frame that I just, uh, that I just referenced in the 80s, uh, in the early 90s. In 1995, we had the second referendum. Uh, we were again in, in the thick of some serious, um, uh, some serious uh, 
crisis around language, around national unity. And so uh, Alliance Quebec at the time under the uh, direction, the executive director was our good friend, David Birnbaum, had uh, supported this initiative to create an organization that would address young Anglophones and non-Francophones who were leaving Quebec uh, en masse. And uh, YES was, uh, was founded by some well-known uh, people in our community, uh, people like, um, like John Dobson and, and, and Jim Hughes and, and Brent Walker and Peter Johnson from McGill. So that, that basically gives you an understanding uh, of where we're coming from and what our influence is. And over the years we've evolved, I think we continue to be a, a very important resource for our community. Uh, yes, uh, really, uh, no, people know us as Yes Youth Employment Services Montreal, but, but I can share with you that we've become much more than just youth, much more than just employment services, and much more than just Montreal. Uh, we are, uh, youth continue to be a key pillar of our mission, but we also work with entrepreneurs and artists of all age categories. We work with English speaking communities outside of Montreal and uh, in the regions. Last year, even with the lockdown, our center in the heart of downtown Montreal, uh, at the corner of Sherbrooke and, and Robert Barassa, uh, we, we had to shut down because of COVID. We still continue to, to serve over 3,700 clients. And I, I, I want to now bring you to uh, some initiatives, yes, initiatives that really tie in with the, this conversation around Bill 96. Uh, in uh, 2015, we did a documentary, uh, Community Voices, and maybe some of you uh, might have had the opportunity to, to see it. But Community Voices really was reaching out to over 500 English-speaking youth right across Quebec and to uh, gauge from them what, uh, how they saw their future in Quebec. Unfortunately, 79% of those young people were planning to leave Quebec because they weren't able to find the jobs that were suited to their training and to their abilities. 69% of them had shared with us that they were underemployed. Next, in 2017, we did uh, what we call the Employment in Quebec Regions Needs Assessment Study. And again, the key findings were English speakers were worse off socioeconomically than French speakers. That's, that's the reality to this day. English speakers in the regions have limited access to employment services and expressed very high dissatisfaction with the services that they were able to access. Then in the same year in 2017, we, we organized a cross community forum, youth unemployment forum, and we called it youth unemployment, it's everyone's business. That brought together 100 practitioners and a lot of youth attended. The top three barriers that were identified for employment as far as English speaking youth uh, are concerned are the following, language skills gap, no surprise there. Soft skills gap, number two, and three challenges facing newcomers. And at, at YES, what we do is we try to address those gaps. And that's basically the heart of our mission. Our mission is we are the only dedicated English service provider committed to helping Quebecers to find jobs and start or grow their businesses in Quebec. And we do that through a wide array of resources a one-on-one -on -one coaching and employment counseling, a workshops that are offered by professionals from different sectors, our mentoring program, and French. We do have a, a French programming. We have now a, a, a new French program, which is really French for the workforce, which is, which is helping non-francophones. Uh, non How do you present yourself? How do you do that elevator pitch in, in French? What about you know, being familiar with the jargon in your industry in French? But the reality is, even before Bill 96, and despite you know, the, the efforts that, 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 uh, that ourselves and our network of community partners are putting in, we still saw at YES uh, a, a very high level of our clients who happen to be newcomers who come to Quebec from outside of Quebec, from the rest of Canada or from overseas, uh, you know, we, we, we have about 30% of our, of our clients who are newcomers. And more than half of those were still leaving the province. And this was before Bill 96. So that's, that was really, that's, that's the, the, the starting point of, uh, the, of the challenge that we are facing. Now, these are people that are, that are very uh, happy to be coming to Quebec. They're attracted, they're drawn by Montreal, 
by uh, Montreal's diversity, uh, Quebec's thriving economy. I mean, I remind uh, everybody that about up to two years ago, Quebec was the leading job creator in Canada. And, but despite that, uh, the, 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 the challenges for somebody who's a non-francophone, somebody who's a newcomer, very motivated, there are still significant challenges for them to be able to settle in Quebec and to build careers. Again, this is the reality on the ground before Bill 96 was on the horizon. We help aspiring entrepreneurs from places, I mean, we have entrepreneurs from the gas bay right up to entrepreneurs from, from the Middle East and from Iran. We make the case, I mean, we are Quebec's ambassadors. We make the case for them to give Quebec a try and we coach them and, and we support them through our resources, our workshops. Uh, we build strong networks. We make sure that, that uh, there, there is a supporting network for talent to be able to, to succeed in Quebec. The spirit and provisions of Bill 96 will make our work a lot harder. Uh, first, by imposing new regulations when small and medium-sized businesses are just recovering from a historic pandemic is counterproductive. Imposing any unnecessary regulations on small business, uh, never mind under the current circumstances, is, is not you know, a good policy under any circumstances. And we can hear, you know, we, we hear that also from, from, French, from French business people themselves who understand what I am saying. Our friends at the uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, for example, uh, who are very much lamenting the kind of regulations that now they're, they're going to be subject to if this becomes law. There are 1,300, just to give you an example, there are 1,300 tech startups in Montreal. These are firms that have teams working from all over the world. How are these firms going to be able to work in French when English is the working language of their, of their sector and when they are uh, experts based in, in countries all over the world? Um, so there's a question mark around the, the, the good sense of these types of regulations, given the, 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 uh, the, the profile of the type of new companies and new technologies that we have in our economy. Uh, over 70% of our exports go to the US. How can we tell these exporters, these successful dynamic Quebec companies that they now have to make the case why they require their professionals to, be, uh, to have English speaking skills? What doesn't the government of Quebec understand? Second, English, there are too many English speakers. This is our experience at YES, you know, our clients who are talented, who have the skills, but who don't have confidence uh, in their French. So there are opportunities, there are job opportunities that might ask for bilingualism, or there might be some component of French. And the, and the, the knee-jerk reaction is to self-select, to take them out of the running, to take themselves out of the running, not to apply for those positions because they are concerned about their ability uh, to, 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 to speak an adequate French. And, and in many instances, um, they are underestimating their abilities. However, Bill 96 drives the point home that the language bar has now been raised beyond their reach. Third, we interpret Bill 96 as officially shutting down any English pathway for non-francophone job seekers, entrepreneurs, artists to gain a foothold in Quebec City. And I'm sorry, Quebec society. Essentially, it condemns the work that we do at YES and many of our partners in the community. Fundamentally, we are in the people and talent business and measures that create obstacles for talented, motivated English speakers to fulfill their potential are not good for our collective success. Why go back to making it easier for our kids and newcomers to set up shop anywhere but here in Quebec? So those are, those are my, my comments that I, I invite you to, um, to basically uh, include in the brief that you have. Uh, and I, I'm very happy to engage in a conversation with you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Eleni, you got a question? Yes, thank you, Joan. And thank you, Aki. Um, you do make a compelling uh, argument and uh, do bring to light the fact that we are losing so much talent, talent that could contribute significantly to Quebec society. If you were to make, and I'm not going to go into all your brief or because I, I, others who have also come before this committee have also talked about 
uh, how Bill will, uh, in one way, be a brain drain from Quebec, and another also be a barrier to having more professionals from other countries and services. And in terms of impacting the trade between various countries that we've signed agreements with, for example, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, but if you were to make one recommendation uh, that would have a direct impact on your own organization and the work that you've been doing uh, to make changes to Bill 96, I know I'm putting you on the spot perhaps, but it is, it is important for the QCGN to go into these hearings, obviously with all these briefs, but with having very concrete uh, recommendations for change to the actual legislation. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Eleni. Thank you for, uh, um, for the question. Um, just, to, just to share with you, we work closely with Emploi Quebec. Uh, because Emploi Quebec, and there is a quarter of the Quebec government that's, that recognizes um, we're, 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 we're facing serious uh, human resource shortages, labor shortages. Uh, there is, the, the fact is that there are English speakers, uh, there, there are more English speakers, uh, the unemployment rate among English speakers is higher in Quebec than it is for French speakers. And there is an interest, there is an interest and an openness to addressing that. And we're, we're part of that, we're part of that movement. Uh, so, um, so I, I just want to, you know, that's an important give people perspective uh, that there is some pragmatism in this in this debate and it, it, it revolving around uh, employment because that's that's in everybody's interest and everybody recognizes that. Um, I would say that um, the principle, one of the, the core principles that that I I would like uh, to be recognized is. Uh, the, the notion of French immersion, as, we, as we've done it in our schools, on, you know, in the job market, you know, in the employment field, give non-Francophones the opportunity to have a French immersion experience on the job, through internships, through uh, you know, new relationships with French employers. The goodwill and the interest, I believe, is there. Um, that, you know, that, that, needs to, that needs to be built on. Internships are a, a very successful tool uh, for employment. They're, they're costly, but when, they, when we, we mm -hmm. have an experience at YES where we were uh, running internship programs that had phenomenal success rates. So um, the Quebec government, Quebec Public Service, we all know the reality of the, of the public service for, for non-Francophones and the representation of English speakers in the Quebec Public Service. Let's, let's have a French immersion uh, option for, 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 for young Anglophones, graduates, uh, you know, uh, very capable people um, whose French might not be at, at, that, at, a, at that high standard, but open the door and allow them to be able to grow into those roles. Uh, I, I just want, I, I, one of, the, one of the, 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 the priorities for us is we're not creating, you know, and, and, and some people, especially from the other side, might, might suggest we're creating ghettos and, and newcomers that come to Quebec and we're, we're, we're channeling them into, the, in, into English and, and that's not, you know, that's not the, you know, uh, the right thing to do. We're not, we're not about that. We're about, you know, in a very competitive world, Quebec being a beacon for talent and being a welcoming place for talent. And absolutely, we know we, as part of the, the coaching, the support that we give to our clients, we make them aware of the reality in Quebec and, 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 and the French culture and the French language. And again, there's a lot of positive positivity around that. But concretely, when people need to, to, uh, to, you know, to find work, when they need to have income, when they need to pursue their profession, um, we, you know, there's, there's, there's too many obstacles that are colored by language that um, that basically make us a, a less welcoming economy. And I you, can I suggest yeah. something, Aki? Can I suggest uh, something that I've been thinking about while you've been speaking and other speakers have brought forward? And I didn't mean to interrupt you if you want to finish, no. sorry. I thought you were finished. And if John will permit me. Of course. Uh, uh, the internship, I know, are, are very helpful programs. Having been a former member of parliament, I know that many, many cases that came before me also of, of immigrants who were very talented, who were professionals, who couldn't have access also to their own profession because of the rules under the Ordre des Professions du Québec. 
would you uh, recommend that perhaps those sections in the bill that touch directly on employment, especially in those areas where there is a need for more workers, uh, could be suspended until the actual workers manage to acquire a level of uh, French knowledge uh, that would be appropriate for the type of job because not everybody needs to be perfect in French for certain jobs that they need. They just need to be able to read documents, uh, prepare documents perhaps. And uh, well, of course there are always translation services, but be able to converse at least in French. It's something I've been thinking about during these, these discussions that per, specifically for those jobs where we do not have workers and we do need to bring in workers from overseas or through the immigration process. Um, would you agree with, with that type of recommendation? Uh, Eleni, absolutely. I would agree with that. I, but I, I want to emphasize that I want this mindset to change, that, you know, that there's, there should be legitimate pathways for non-francophones uh, to be able to find their comfort zone so they can grow and they can make their place in Quebec society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, and, and the other the other point, just last point I'd like to make is, of course, the, the CJP restrictions are absolutely, uh, we have a, a, a very hard time with the CJP restrictions. If there's anything that we should be doing as a society is our young people should be able to uh, broaden their horizons to the maximum. And to be telling French Quebecers, young French Quebecers open to the world, you know, and are growing in an economy that is so connected to the United States, to tell, to tell them that they, 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 they will not be able to access or there'll be limits on their access to English speaking CJEP, I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Marcus. Thank you, Aki, for your presentation. Um, and I agree fully with what you uh, with what you just closed with with the access to English CJEPs. Uh, I'm wondering if the part of the bill that uh, that that highlight or that will allow um, all Quebecers access to French courses, if that in and of itself is going to be enough to help the situation, because I know in many industries and working with some colleges and universities. I know that stages or internships are, are hard to come by. They're, they're expensive, but they're also an investment by those industries, but they're still hard to come by. So does, does the provision that will allow young Anglophones, maybe all Anglophones access to uh, French education, French uh, language uh, learning, will that alone be enough to help stem uh, the tie towards people leaving the province or even coming to the province? Um, I think that it will be an important step forward and it will be uh, a major um, opportunity for our community. It, it will be very helpful and, and we support that, absolutely. But as we know, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's more than, than the language as well. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about, if you look at our community, a, um, certain minority communities and racialized communities are, are struggling with very high unemployment rates. And uh, these are communities also, you know, where, where French is spoken, where, 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 where people, you know, do have a grasp of French, but they are still, you know, they are, they are still stuck with very high unemployment rates and, and very high levels of socioeconomic distress. So it's we have so language is absolutely bringing in more uh, you know opening up uh, French courses to all Quebecers, uh, one hundred percent support it. But we also need the other pieces. We need we need, we need the, the, the uh, you know the, the connections with with uh, with business uh, with, with business, and we need to have you know internships. Um, that's vital. I mean internships are are, are a very important uh, component. Where it means, and we understand in, in the past when it's worked and it, and it worked so well, is when government did make the investment, as Eleni mentioned, it, 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 it's an investment that is worthwhile for, for, for everybody. Um, and um, it, it's just uh, one of the strongest avenues for young people to be able to find work uh, and to be able to establish themselves. It does work. It's expensive, but it more than pays for itself. And it's just 
So I don't understand why there's so, such restrictions uh, on this or some uh, hesitation. The other, the, other, the other point I would make is also the whole uh, vocational training uh, field. We are so backward uh, in, in terms of recognizing the trades and encouraging you know, young people to, 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 to go into the trades. Uh, compared to what's being done in Europe, I mean, we are very backward, and then that's that's another channel, you know, for uh, for employment opportunities. So, uh, so absolutely, as a, it, it, it's absolutely essential that we, we 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 improve our French fluency, and that we have that ability. But we also need, you know, we need we need to have the kind of projects that I mentioned, the kind of uh, programming that I that I mentioned. And, and, the, and there's a different reality. There's a, there's a reality of Montreal, and there's also the reality of our English speaking communities outside of Montreal. And they don't have a yes in, in those communities. So, so, um, so you know, th 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 these, are the, these are the pieces that we as a community need to have in place. Uh, and we don't need, uh, again, when people come and people are already hesitant and they, they lack the confidence to succeed in Quebec, we do not need to raise those barriers as Bill 96 seems to be uh, heading towards. Can I just have a quick uh, other qu another question, uh, Joan, if that's okay? Of course. Uh, how, how does YES define youth and youth in need of employment? And I say that because a growing segment of the population that is going to need help with uh, employment is not just youth, but it's going to be middle age and more senior citizens as well. And uh, can, can YES respond to that as well, or is it going to require uh, a different type of organization? So uh, we, you know, our, our age, I mean, basically youth, it's, we've stretched it. So it's 18 to 35. So it's quite a, quite a, a, a significant segment of the population that we are working with and that we, that we can serve, uh, Marcus. Um, there's other organizations for, for, for you know, older professionals who have been out of the job market. There's certainly other organizations. There are resources you know, for that population as well. I wonder if I could sneak in a question. Mark, I'm sorry, Marcus, are you done? Sure. Okay. Um, internships. Obviously, everybody agrees that internships are uh, are the gold standard and the necessary gold standard. Um, but I'd like to know a little more about them, particularly for, in our case, anglophones getting internships in French-speaking work environments. How long does an internship need to be? for those people, those young people, to become comfortable in the work world. Because it's one thing to speak French, even to live part of your life in French, is very different to work full time in French or in any, any second language. Same is true for Francophones moving into the English world. So how long does it take, do you think? Uh, there has to be some flexibility. Not everybody is the same. Uh, no. I would say like six months would be a, a reasonable uh, time frame. Uh, and it's not just about, and, and, and the definition of, of a good internship isn't just about the actual learning on the job. It's also no. about the supports, the mentoring. Yeah. Those, those have to be there as well. This is, you know, we're, we're talking about a holistic approach. Working, you know, working with, with the employer to address you know, issues and, and, and building the person's confidence and making sure you know, they've got you know, those soft skills that we always talk about. So it's, it's the whole package, uh, Senator Fraser. Okay. Um, what, you said you work closely with Emploi Quebec. What exactly do you do with them? Well, um, so uh, there is, there is, um, there is a, um, uh, there is this category of, um, of service that Emploi Quebec supports for uh, special, uh, special um, I, I guess it might be, not be the best word, but, but hard to employ, hard, harder to employ communities. And English speaking communities considered to be you know, one of those. 
So, Emploi, so there is that recognition from Emploi Quebec, and we have a, a contract with Emploi Quebec. Our, 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 uh, our employment counseling services are funded by Emploi Quebec to assist you know, English speakers uh, to find jobs. Okay. Go on. Yeah, so, right. And, and, and I just want to say, and just to give, I think it's important for, for, for you to, to understand the work that's being done around employment. And, and the seriousness, so this is, this is you know, uh, the, the government, this government is uh, serious about unemployment and employment and employability. And what, they, what we have now is, uh, thanks to our community, we've, we've, uh, we have a new organization, which is called the Provincial Employment Roundtable. You'll start hearing more about them, PERT. And what PERT is, PERT builds on the work that YES did, which is to bring together all of the organizations the employers and the universities and the professional training schools together that serve the English speaking community so that we as a community can have a united voice on what are the needs that we have on the ground. And one of the very important breakthroughs is that the government of Quebec has created an advisory committee, which is going to be advising Emploi Quebec. And that's very important because these advisory committees are there and they have, they have you know, uh, access to the decision makers at Emploi Quebec to uh, propose policies that will make sense on the ground. So the English speaking, we there, there will be an English speaking, we're in the process of putting it together, an English speaking um, advisory committee that it's gonna be working directly with Emploi Quebec. I sit on that committee. Uh, other, other people with you know, significant experience are, are sit on that committee. So it'll be the first time that we actually have that kind of recognition at the at the high uh, you know in, in the inner circle of Emploi Quebec. Mm -hmm. That's good news. It is good news. Look, thank you so much. Um, it's been really very helpful to us to hear about yes and about all that you do and about what you need. So we're very grateful to you for taking the time to be with us. It, it was. It it was my, ple my pleasure, uh, very nice to be able to, to exchange with you, very thoughtful people with you know, uh, important contributions that you've made to the community. And thank you for carrying the ball on this one because this is a big one, as we all know. Yeah, it is. So thanks very much again. Thank you. And colleagues, our next presenter will be uh, Amrit. Call or call. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Her name? <laughs> uh, says says in my cheat sheet. It says he. However, uh, representing the World Sikh Organization, the of of Canada, the WSO, which is a nonprofit organization with a mandate to promote and protect the interests of Canadian Sikhs as well as to promote and advocate for the protection of human rights for all individuals. Not surprisingly, it has been one of the interveners in the Bill 21 case, and Amrit has been leading the file on its behalf. So welcome, thanks very much for being with us. Thank and you for having uh, me. Floor, the floor is yours. So on behalf of the World Sick Organization of Canada, as a board member, I'm here to discuss the serious concerns of Bill 96, specifically in records and um, in terms of human rights, the erosion of individual rights and the consequential impact it's going to have on newly landed immigrants and people who come from an Anglophone background, as well as students who would like to have access to English resources. Um, so the World Sick Organization was founded in 1984, and um, as previously mentioned, the mandate is to protect Canadian Sikh interests as well as all Canadians in Canada. So we have a board of 31 members, and each region has their specific team. So I come from the Quebec team, although I live in BC right now, I'm still heavily still, my heart is still in Quebec. My body might be physically in BC, but my heart is here. Um, firstly, Bill 96. Um, is attempting to establish the supremacy of the French language over um, rights that have been stipulated in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as the Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and there are issues with that. 
Um, the, 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 uh, the Quebec government repeatedly and unprecedentedly is using the non-withstanded clause, which is also greatly concerning. Once again, with respect to Bill 96, the Quebec government has invoked the non-withstanding clause to prioritize the French language and interfere with individual rights of the people. Um, Bill 96 also follows in the footsteps of Bill 21. Um, and Bill 21 was the first time in history that the non withstanding clause has been used to suspend provisions in both the Canadian Charter and the Quebec Charter as well, and now Bill 96 is the second. So this bill is introducing um, a legacy, if you can say, uh, using the non-withstanding clause and trumping both charters. So that is highly problematic. And um, the use of the non-withstanding clause in both of these instances has been limited and constrained to the minorities in Quebec. And this is alarming and a dangerous precedent. We have Anglophones who have been in Quebec since day one. Yes, they can speak French. Yes, they can integrate. But at the same time, being an Anglophone, you are allowed to have um, resources and the ability to speak in English because we are a bilingual province. Um, Thirdly, Bill 96 challenges a principle that the access to the justice system is fundamentally um, a Canadian value. If passed, non-French speaking Quebecers would be required to attach certified French translations to the legal proceedings. This would increase costs and also add to the delays, making Quebec justice less accessible to non-speaking French Quebecers. The other potential impacts of Bill 96 include restricting career and education prospects of Quebecers with limited French proficiency or those who choose to study in English institutions, therefore possibly limiting the scope of jobs or the industries that they might be going into. In summary, Bill 96 creates significant barriers for minorities by reducing public services and limiting the, el the eligibility towards them. In addition, it creates complications to accessing justice for, for all Quebecers, um, and it has a further potential to underrepresent communities living and thriving in Quebec. Um, as a religious minority, we understand that preserving language is important. There's no question about that. Um, and also at the same time, protecting identity. However, that does not go to the expense of other individuals who have made Quebec their home and have integrated. Um, we're seeing with this bill that there's a severe governmental policy disenfranchising minorities and communities, and this is becoming a norm. It's becoming a norm in Quebec to question who is Quebec and who is not, who is Canadian and who is not Canadian. And these are conversations that quite necessary, uh, that aren't quite necessary. Um, and we've never had them in the past, so what is the need to have them now? And we urge the government to consider a more balanced approach in preserving language while still respecting the rights of all people living in Quebec. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we get to ask you questions, if that's okay. Sure. Eleni. Uh, thank you so much, Amrit. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. They always mispronounce my name, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you pronounced it well. Uh, I thank you so much. Uh, and I also uh, have been following some of the, what's been going on with Bill 21, because I do feel the two bills are linked. And I think you, you also realize that. Yeah. You talked at the end of your presentation about a balanced approach. Yes. So far, uh, do you, obviously you feel that it hasn't been a balanced approach, that there's been only legislation that's come down and it's taken away certain rights of Quebecers. How do we end up having a balanced approach? I mean, I think that the communities that opposed Bill 21 have taken it through the judicial system. Uh, obviously, it's going to go farther than just the first uh, decision of the courts, which did see that it is discriminatory, but felt that they were not going to uh, strike down the law as mm. such. Uh, what would be a balanced approach in your opinion? And I'll go even further than that, Joan, if you permit me. Uh, I am looking, and I think uh, the Quebec Community Groups Network is looking for very concrete recommendations in terms of sections of Bill 96 uh, that we could 
give recommendations to the government to either exempt or delay or perhaps even strike. That is our hope. That is really our hope. So if there's something specific that you feel 96, uh, because there's there's a lot there, obviously, and the notwithstanding clause does not, you know, precludes this, but I, we want to be constructive. Uh, and, and we want to be able to help the government arrive at a, at a bill that's much more reasonable than it is at the present time. So I'm sorry, I spoke too long, but if you can give me one or two recommendations that would really uh, make significant uh, changes to the bill oh. and, and would be more balanced approach. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple in mind right now. Um, there's one concern I have. There are some individuals who have immigrated to Quebec because they were recruited by their companies and because their fields are so specialized, they're in niche fields, they are not required to speak in French because it might be um, so niche that there aren't, you know, a plethora of people to pick from. Is there a grandfather in for them for job security? Um, the next thing is when it comes to accessing education. Um, I have friends who studied at UDM, but their textbooks were all in English. So it, it proves the point, what resources are you using? Now, if you're going to create barriers for people accessing English education, are there enough resources in French for that to be possible? And um, I, I went to Concordia University. Um, I've shadowed some courses in McGill and you have the opportunity to um, mm -hmm. present your work in English or French, right? So those mm -hmm. accommodations have been made um, in these English universities. Now I'm wondering these um, students who are forced for whatever reason to attend Quebec, um, I mean not Quebec, French institutions, do they have those same rights in their universities? Very um, good point. The, the next point that I have is um, when we look at, um, you know, uh, using the non-withstanding non clause, okay, um, we're constantly using it and it's constantly going against two charters. So, it, it begs the question, does the charter need to be changed? I mean, I personally don't think it needs to, but you know, it, it's, I mean, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to always keep using the non-withstanding clause and it's used in some sort of, you know, maniacal way that, oh, we have to use this little cheat code, right? So, you know, it doesn't really quite make sense because what you have written as your values do not align with your actions. So it's a bit confusing. Um, and then just one moment, something did come to my mind. Um, in terms of um, legal proceedings, for someone who is an Anglophone, will they be charged if they need translations? I mean, in the end of the day, it's all about accessibility, right? So if you've created a barrier, how are you making sure that all individuals still have equal accessibility? Thank you so much. That's very helpful. I mean, and and uh, we wish you luck in the battle with Bill 21 also. Thank you so much. Marcus, do you have a question? Elaine covered most of what I wanted to ask, but um, looking to the future, and I've asked, I've asked other groups this this morning, what does the future look like for the, the Sikh community in Quebec? Is it going to be able to attract people to move here? Does the six month requirement for uh, achieving uh, linguistic capability in French, is that going to be A, long enough? And uh, B, will it also be a hindrance to enticing people to come to live in Quebec? It's a great hindrance. Um, the Sikh community, like any community, it, it has various subsets, right? So for the children and the teenagers, it'll be fine. They'll pick up the language quickly, right? But for their parents or their guardians, it's a bit problematic because you don't know what economic conditions you are living under and what you know your day-to-day -day is. And having a timeline of six months to somewhat master a language 
I mean, in terms of learning something, you can never put a timeline in. So it's very restricting in that sense. And, and we've seen it across the years. Anglophones are moving out of Quebec because of a lack of resources. So um, yes, individuals are trying their hardest to integrate, but there are so many barriers coming, coming in that realistically, I think the people who have been living there for a long time who are retired, they will continue to live there. However, um, young families, you know, unless they have, you know, the proper resources and access to those reasons to stay in, you know, Quebec, they will, otherwise they might possibly move. So, and another growing concern is um, the issue of so many private colleges um, across Canada. And I, I've seen it that there are a lot of students coming in and these students are coming in internationally and they are not that proficient in English. So French is a big undertaking. Um, and realistically, they have no ambitions to stay in Quebec, right? So they're not contributing to the infrastructure. Um, and because of that, in terms of, uh, you know, needs and whatnot, they are not being addressed. You're just having a migration of people across the land. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the amount of English that could be used in CEGEPs, French language, mm -hmm. uh, CEGEPs in universities. And there is material in Bill 96 about this, um, very sharply limiting the number of courses that can be taught in English. And more than that, I would have to go back and reread that section of the bill because I must say, that when I read it, I was more focused on um, the requirements for English language education than I was for French language education. But there, there is stuff in there. Clearly, they don't want um, CEGEPs that are Francophone institutions suddenly to become bilingual now that Francophones are being discouraged from going to English CEGEPs. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you know, about as acutely yourself as, as anybody. What is the impact on minorities? Not just the physical impact, but the psychological, emotional impact on minorities of what seems to be becoming the repeated use of notwithstanding clauses. Um, I know for myself, when I heard about Bill 96, I, it's like PTSD over what had happened during Bill 21 just, you know, came to me. Um, uh, I think repeatedly hearing that you are not a Quebecer, even though you've done everything that any other individual has, who might not have the same skin color as you, might not exactly look the same way as you, is traumatizing emotionally um, and even just mentally, it's draining having to constantly justify yourself. And in the end of the day, if you've made a certain area your home, you are looking to integrate into that area. You're, you're a part of that community in whatever way that manifests. So repeatedly being told it builds a complex in yourself. And I think it also gives you know, a two tier society where we have people othering you without even knowing you and you come home and you, and you think to yourself, okay, well, I'm doing something wrong, right? Or you grow up having that complex, complex. Um, some of my friends, their children, they, you know, they wear religious symbols and they're treated that like there's some deep, some type of deviant. And then um, I have friends who are, you know, uh, perfectly bilingual. And if they speak in English, it's just like, okay, well, you know what, you're an Anglophone, you're from another, you're, you're, you're English Canadian. But the thing that people don't understand is if you're a Quebecer living in another province, you still aren't part of that province. I've lived in BC for three years now. I don't feel like a British Columbian. If anything, I get ribbed at that, oh, you Quebecer. And I think like a Quebecer, but the reality is, is I'm an Anglophone, right? Yes, I, French is such a big part of my identity. I teach French here in BC. That's how big a part of my identity it is. But at the same time, I'm, I'm an Anglophone and Anglophones have a place in Quebec. Historically, Anglophones have been in Quebec for hundreds and hundreds of years. So now to kick them out of their home 
or create barriers for them that never existed prior. I, I don't really understand the need. Everybody has a love and appreciation for French, right? But it's just what, what's happening now is just very, I guess, unsolicited laws. There, even the public consultations are, are, are very skewed. I know this initiative right here, it's trying to change that, right? Um, but when Quebecers are supposedly asked, I don't think there's a diversity in that pool of Quebecers being asked. Mm. Um, you've, you've lived now in Montreal and Vancouver. I, I don't think that the Sikh community in Montreal is very large, not as large, for example, yeah. as the Muslim community, but it is large in Vancouver. Yes. You, you don't feel like a British Columbian, but is it easier to be a Sikh in Vancouver than it is in Montreal? Yes, it's much easier because people don't see that I'm a Sikh. They just see that I'm a teacher first. Hmm. Because my appearance is so normalized that it's not a big deal. And frankly, I haven't really spoken about my faith living here. Um, if anything, it's just, oh, she is another Canadian. That's it. Yeah which is, it's nice. And that's how I remember Quebec was when I was growing up. Yeah, I just wondering, you know, charters of rights are supposed to protect the rights of minorities against yeah. majorities. Um, and the fear of minorities, sometimes I, I, I just think it's based on a lack of understanding of, lack of familiarity. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, we had, we had a witness yeah. earlier this morning who said, look, you know, I just want them to get to know me and realize I'm the same person. I am a person like them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that will happen in the next few years, but we can look forward to the day when that happens. Yeah, I think. For something, I, I mean, things have to break eventually at some point, right? And they break when everybody's just had enough. So, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think um, we're we're in a very odd time because we have one bill that came in effect to a law, but there's so much contention still after one year of it even being passed, regardless of a legal battle or not, to the point that the news is being monopolized by a reporter's, you know, way of phrasing her question. Because it, it's, it's obvious there is something very problematic in it. Now, this second bill is following in that footsteps. What is Quebec going to be uh, a province of just controversy? I mean, that's not sustainable in the end of the day. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and any, Marcus, any further questions? Uh, I did one uh, very quickly, and I don't know if we have time. You did talk yeah. about if the notwithstanding clause overrides the charter then maybe we have to change the charter. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into the battles that took place in trying to actually come up with, with a Canadian Bill of Rights or a charter. Uh, uh, are you, um, I mean, are, are you saying that at the end of the day, perhaps we should be looking uh, after Bill 96, because I do believe Bill 96, hopefully there will be changes, but if there aren't, should we be looking then at, at um, suggesting or recommending changes to the charter, both uh, federally and provincially? I mean, I'm in favor of the, the federal uh, charter of rights and freedoms. However, I just, I find it very problematic that you're having to run to the non-withstanding clause. Quebec has its autonomy, I 100% agree with that, right? But I don't understand why every law that is being proposed goes against Quebec's own charter of values. And if it does, then it, there's, there's a disconnect clearly, right? So my, my piece is the fact that you're having to use an stop withstanding clause says something about your culture, right? About your province's culture, you're going, you're, you're fighting with yourself. Why are you fighting with yourself? There's an issue there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Amrit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marcus, anything to add? No? Look, thank you very much. And I assume you're, um, you're in Vancouver as we speak, are you not? Yes, I am. I took a half a day off. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're grateful to you. And I hope you didn't have to get up too early in the morning to do this. Um, Any, anything tried... for the cause. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Tell me how Thank to you pronounce so your last name. So it's like an apple core, Amrit core. Cool. Cool. Core. 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 Like, a, core. like an apple core, core. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Core, thank you very much. It's thank been, you so uh, much for your questions. Very enlightening for us. <laughs> Take care. And colleagues, our last speaker of the day is, he's here, he's got slides up already, is John Buck of SIDIC. <clears throat> On behalf of English speakers in Quebec, CIDIC works with a broad range of national, provincial, local, public, private, and civil society actors to help businesses grow and workers succeed in the communities in which they live. John will focus on the economic and business impacts of Bill 96. John, I can see your slide, but I can't see you. Are you there? There you are. I am. Okay. Good afternoon, Ms. Fraser. How are you? Just fine, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Tabachnik. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Bakapanos as well. Uh, really a, a pleasure uh, to be here with you today. And, and thank you for inviting us to uh, share our views on this very, very important um, initiative. I have, uh, like some of my predecessors uh, through, throughout these hearings, prepared some, some notes for you. And, and um, your colleagues that are helping us with the Zoom have kindly agreed to help me uh, pursue the presentation with you. So I'll, I'll, try to, uh, I'll try to stick to the script at the front end of our discussion and, and then certainly hope that we can engage in a conversation as well as we, as we pursue this. Um, and with that, perhaps we can look to the second slide and I can discuss with you really the, the purpose of today's presentation. Um, and really uh, the purpose I, I would outline is us conveying our support, which is important to underline for improving the protection and promotion of French as the official language of Quebec while protecting and promoting the rights of the English speaking community in Quebec. Convey our concerns over many aspects of Bill 96, including its overtones for the Canadian Federation, its potential impact on the English speaking community of Quebec and its implications for business. I'd like to emphasize um, the importance of not overburdening the business community with additional regulatory measure, especially in the context of the post pandemic recovery. And finally, um, I have some, some recommendations that I'd like to share with you, specific measures to assess the impacts of Quebec's proposals to reform the Charter of the French language and other provincial legislations. Before I get into those details, and on the next slide, we can um, very briefly introduce uh, CEDEC uh, to you, the Community Economic Development and Employability Corporation. Um, that you'll find uh, again on, on the, uh, the, the slide that's before you. Our purpose is to help drive economic growth and development through collaboration. Uh, we're here to help communities achieve lasting economic success by identifying and leveraging their strongest opportunities for economic growth. And we help create jobs, upskill and place workers, increase wages and revenues, build and grow businesses and social enterprises, and increase investments in our communities. And it's in, in this context that I'll be sharing with you um, today, um, our, our thoughts and, and recommendations. The next slide will, will express um, that um, really we think collaboration is at the heart of living and working together in Quebec. And I'd like to take this opportunity, uh, certainly again, to thank you, Ms. Fraser, uh, Ms. Baco Panos, and, and Mr. Tabachnik for, for your dedication to this cause. And I know your colleague, Mr. Ledwell, as well, who's been uh, here throughout uh, this, this, uh, this effort. Um, we applaud QCGN for organizing these hearings so that individuals and organizations from, a, from across Quebec and from the English speaking community can raise uh, legitimate concerns and work to, together to improve Bill 96 so that French thrives as Quebec's official language while continuing to protect and promote the rights of English speaking community in Quebec. And I think we've seen, and I've had the, the, the real privilege and pleasure of, of watching the hearings um, that uh, have uh, taken place already and look forward to continuing on Friday, uh, just uh, such a dedicated and, and tremendous uh, information that is being shared. And, and uh, again, your platform is, uh, is something we appreciate very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. 
We think also um, that this is going to give QCGN the opportunity to position itself as a key collaborative contributor to the review and um, improvement of Bill 96. And I know that's the spirit of the work that you've undertaken as, as you prepare ultimately for your presence at the hearings that will take place a little bit later uh, this, this month. On to the next slide, I, I want to uh, highlight again our support um, for the protection and promotion of French as Quebec's official language while fully respecting the province's English speaking minority. And I, and I also want to acknowledge our support for Canada's official languages as a cornerstone of our national identity. Although we'll be discussing Bill, we are discussing Bill 96, I, I do want to um, acknowledge the important role that uh, uh, the Federation plays with respect to official languages, and I'll, I'll get into that as we as we proceed. It's important to acknowledge, um, certainly from a business con context, the value of English for conducting successful business activities in North America and beyond. And we urge, um, and I'll get into my recommendations a little bit later on, but having interacted with and talked with the business community uh, at length around the implications uh, of, of this kind of uh, bill, we urge an incentives-driven promotional approach to assist businesses, especially small and medium-sized business ones, in using more French in their daily, daily business activities in Quebec. Some things that we're deeply concerned about on the next slide, and um, I won't read through the first list, but suffice to say uh, that, that the, these that are highlighted in blue or on the blue background, I, I think demonstrate um, the, the um, concern that we have around the potential effects of Bill 96 on Canada in general, and, and we've listed these here. Um, and uh, we also, um, of course, uh, as well, um, are concerned about the definition of who is part of Quebec nation and by extension, who is part of Quebec. Now, on to the next slide, and I think uh, given our mandate and, and area of activity, this is perhaps a particularly relevant contribution that we can make to the hearings. Um, deeply concerned uh, about the impact on business operations in Quebec regardless of their size or scale of operations. More bureaucratic reporting requirements will only add to the administrative burdens already being carried out by businesses and small and medium enterprises in particular in Quebec, detracting from the limited resources of time and energy that they can dedicate to the success of their enterprises. We'll have some evidence about their feelings about this a bit later on. And perhaps if we can move to the next slide, um, we'll get closer to that information. And this is important, of course, as we're looking to regulation. Um, a pandemic is a terrible time to introduce additional regulations that can have an impact, a negative impact potentially on businesses. And, and we know that uh, small and medium enterprises have been impacted very negatively uh, throughout the past 18 months. And we know that it continues to be an enormous struggle to be a small and medium enterprise at this point in time. And although we're hopeful um, for um, the future, uh, it remains uh, a very, very challenging time for small, small and medium enterprises, not only in Quebec, of course, but particularly in Quebec. And I think we all uh, experience and, and witness uh, those challenges uh, firsthand uh, in the communities where we live. Some of the evidence that I spoke to earlier, and I, I really, I really have to acknowledge the terrific uh, work that our colleagues at the Canadian Federation of Independent Business ha have done um, to assemble this information. Actually, in a fairly timely way, these this information is all quite recent, from April of 2021. Um, we want to remind the Quebec government that 65% of SMEs in Quebec require English to conduct their business affairs with clients and suppliers as well as to secure additional business contracts. 56% of SMEs believe that they should not be subject to the administrative franchisation formalities required by the Charter of the French language. And importantly, and, and this perhaps will feed into our recommendations as well, SMEs in Quebec believe that 
simplification of regulatory measures related to language, access to French language training and skills development, and government's investments in helping Quebecers improve their French are the most helpful measures in supporting the use of French in business. Now for some recommendations. Um, I, and I've been paying attention, Ms. Bacopanos, as you've asked questions throughout the, the hearing, some, some very specific recommendations perhaps that could be useful. We recommend that the government of Quebec um, conduct in collaboration with the Quebec Community Groups Network and make public an impact analysis of its proposal to reform the Charter of the French language and other provincial legislations public on the vitality and future development of the English speaking community of Quebec. We recommend that the government of Quebec conduct and make public a regulatory impact analysis on Quebec businesses. There's a very specific reference here as provided uh, in its policy on regulatory and administrative release, uh, relief. And, and finally, um, ensure that all new regulatory requirements be sensitive to the current economic context and that they avoid placing additional regulatory burdens on businesses until economic stability returns and recovery is assured. Introducing the Government of Canada, um, and, and I'll acknowledge we're talking about Bill 96, but I think we, we, we find it quite compelling to introduce this information here. We recommend that the Government of Canada provide ongoing and active support to the English speaking communities of Quebec so that the community has the capacity to ensure that its current rights as an official language minority in Canada are respected by the government's uh, Quebec government's proposals to reform the Charter of the French language and other provincial legislations. We recommend that the government of Canada uh, continue to pro provide access to justice in English in Quebec and is protected and promoted. Ensure that access to public services in Quebec uh, in English um, are protected and promoted. And ensure that access to its institutions is maintained and developed as a key pathway to ensuring its continuing contribution to Quebec society. And finally, um, once again, I just want to take this opportunity um, to thank you for inviting us uh, to, to share our views on this ex exceptionally important uh, initiative. Um, highlight again, reiterate our enthusiastic support for the protection and promotion of the French language uh, as the official language of Quebec, while respecting the rights of the English speaking minority of the province. And, and again, I hope that this contribution uh, can be useful as you continue uh, your deliberations and as you prepare uh, ultimately to engage with the uh, government of Quebec. I'm happy to uh, engage in a conversation or, or to respond to any questions that, uh, that any of you may have for me as well. Oh, I didn't realize I was on mute. I was being effusively grateful and thankful to John and assuring him that we did have questions. And I was turning the floor over to you, Eleni. Um, thank you so much, John. But thank you so much, John, for actually making some concrete recommendations. Um, and I'm not gonna go through uh, how difficult it has been for small and medium-sized businesses. We see all those closures in downtown Montreal or anywhere you travel in Quebec and it's very sad uh, because a lot of those workers depended on those businesses to be able to survive. Uh, there was some, of course, we know assistance from the federal government, but that wasn't enough. People need to work uh, not only for their uh, for income, but also for their mental state. I mean, you, you can't be stuck inside. But the pandemic certainly has been an issue that you've brought up a couple of times also in your presentation. And thank you, the presentation was excellent, I must say, and it's good to have, to, to have it visually also for our participants. Uh, you stressed in your recommendations that the Quebec government should do uh, more of an impact study especially on, on small and medium-sized businesses uh, before adopting Bill 96. I think the timeline 
at least from what I understand, is not there at the moment, but it certainly is an excellent recommendation. Uh, do you feel that that study, because there have been studies about whether the French language outside of Montreal, we're talking about now, because in Montreal it's a different situation, the French language in fact has been, uh, has been diminishing uh, in Montreal rather than in, in the rest of, and they use always the example of Montreal when we're talking about the fact that the French language is in danger, okay? Uh, do you feel that the impact studies, knowing that, that the government doesn't always depend on scientific uh, facts uh, to be able to arrive at a conclusion, would the, I know that you feel strongly about the surveys and the impacts, but how can we convince the government that that would be a very good way to proceed in order to have facts before they actually adopt the legislation? I went all about the question, but I think you know where I'm going, John. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, and, and thank you for the question. It's it's a uh, it's a very Im important one. This question of, of persuasion, and, and I think one of the one of the dimensions of the economic impact is that it's universally felt, um, and I think it's perceived as being universally felt when we um, prepare and, and share with you results um, that have emerged through uh, the survey from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. Um, they're not looking uniquely to English-speaking led businesses, uh, English-speaking entrepreneurs. They're looking to businesses in general um, in Quebec. And so when we see, for example, that 65% of SMEs um, do conduct their business and affairs uh, and require English speaking in order to do so, um, evidently there, there is a considerable potential impact um, across the board in terms of our ability to continue um, to benefit economically as a province. So, so you know, beyond again, our English speaking community. And I, I think that is, is um, uh, perhaps a key, I know in the hearings already, it's, it's come up the, the question of how do we engage with the majority of Quebecers around this very important matter our, our contribution to that discussion is that certainly the economy works um, it's something that all of us um, uh, it's, we, we all live within the same economy in Quebec uh, and any uh, legislation that can impact negatively that in, uh, that uh, requires I think it's it's only diligent to investigate um, the potential impact uh, and and then to if necessary make corrections make amendments um, improve the legislation so that it doesn't hinder the economy in ways that um, are important for everyone. Um, of course, in addition to that, we've, we've recommended as well a very specific analysis in terms of the mm -hmm. impacts for the English speaking community. But I think the small and medium enterprise one, again, is, is quite persuasive. It's a Quebec wide discussion, one that engages not only English speakers, but in fact, everyone from Quebec, everyone in Quebec, uh, and, and beyond for that matter, many companies have operations in Quebec that are not exclusively in Quebec. Um, and I think that can be a, a very compelling uh, way to, to move forward. Thank you. And I, I think I, I appreciate very much your comment about francophone, small and medium sized businesses are also impacted by this legislation in terms of workers or finding workers. And we do have a lack of uh, certain uh, workers and for certain industries. In fact, I understood a lot of the restaurant owners are finding, uh, are finding it hard to find uh, uh, waiters and waitresses or even chefs for a lot of their restaurants, uh, which is a business I know very well because my father ran a restaurant for 30 years. So um, I, I wanna go to your other part of your presentation, if you permit me, John, about how, uh, you mentioned that the federal government should be more involved, okay? And we've seen recently that, uh, because we're in a federal election campaign, the majority of the leaders uh, don't feel that Bill 96, at the moment, at least perhaps, perhaps after the election, I don't know, I hope, <laughs> but uh, don't feel that uh, they should speak up about some of the negative uh, impacts, especially on the economy, because they're all talking about the economy, they're all talking about jobs. Um, has the CDEC with their partners uh, on the national level, uh, has, have they made any attempt, uh, perhaps not now during the election campaign, but will they be making attempts to try to convince our uh, federal legislators and politicians that this is directly impacting, uh, impacting the economy? Um, 
I, I, indeed, I mean, the, the discussion, the analysis, and again, it's, it's an analysis that is likely more sophisticated than we've been able to undertake so far, but, but any, any um, legislation that can hinder um, the, the uh, recovery uh, at this point in time, I'll, I'll say the recovery and, and ultimately mm -hmm. the growth of the economy is something that is of great concern for us and something that I am also confident is of great concern uh, for Canada in general when we look to um, the, the nation and uh, when we look to, sorry, to, to, uh, to the country uh, and its implications. It's our, our feeling, um, again, that, um, that the government of Canada does have a role to play, certainly in an official languages context. And we're all familiar with the nation building uh, that has occurred over the years in terms of the promotion uh, of, of, um, of bilingualism, the promotion of official languages. And we are very supportive of that and, and uh, would, would certainly uh, support and, and, and advocate for the continued presence of the government of Canada in all things related to official languages. When I spoke to you earlier, and I believe it was on slide six that I shared some of the um, deep concerns we have uh, potentially on, on official languages in Canada. Um, and and uh, I think we've, we've all seen evidence of this. This is a great concern for some of our colleagues outside of the province of Quebec uh, are, are very close and, and very, um, you know, uh, I think uh, collaborative French speaking colleagues outside of the province of Quebec are watching with, with great concern uh, everything that is here. And I think would also um, uh, certainly advocate for that um, important, in fact, critical role that the, the government of Canada needs to continue to play with respect to supporting official language minority communities um, throughout Canada. Thank you, John. Quebec, including Quebec. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Marcus, do you have a question? To follow up on the employment side of uh, Eleni's questions, um, you know that uh, that Youth Employment Services uh, focuses on the 18 to 35 group, but a growing group of unemployed uh, people are over that age now uh, uh, with the economic conditions and with uh, the recovery. Um, I'm wondering, I know CDEC focuses on economic development, but what about employees in the middle and older age groups and what support would there be for them? And what potential effect could Bill 96 have on those uh, groups of employees? Thank you, Mr. Javashnik, for a, a very good question. And certainly, um, we, we often and we've we've led some initiatives related to what we've called mature workers um, over the past several years. And in fact, ironically, our chair will be um, uh, presenting uh, in the upcoming week uh, with Seniors Action Quebec a whole session related to um, mature workers uh, in Quebec. I think that th there's there's no uh, absolutely um, uh, I, I would suggest no, um, no doubt that mature workers can be impacted negatively um, by an economy that is not reaching its potential. Um, and certainly if we look to the use, for example, of, um, of, of, of more French within a workplace and, and um, I think Aki um, earlier in, in um, the information he shared with you talk, talked about the, the relevance and the importance of this. We really would need to support, and as we do now and would want to continue in the future, try to ensure that individuals have access to the uh, adequate training um, for skills development. And of course, I, I think often when we look to um, the 18 to 35 group, we're, we're already involved. Um, and Mr. Tvachnik, you know this better than, than I do. Uh, in fact, I'd argue maybe better than most do um, that the, the importance of school and, and that, that important connection that exists uh, for young people between school and, um, and their lives. And of course, access to language learning is one of those uh, dimensions of education that's very accessible and, and, um, and very close for younger people in most cases. 
We have a very bilingual com community, we know, and, and many have benefited from the tremendous uh, French language skills that are, are offered um, throughout our, our school system, our English school system in Quebec. The same is not necessarily true for um, those that are mature. They, they may have become slightly disconnected from the learning environment. They would need to be, I think, engaged in, in different ways. Um, and, and proactively, we would need to engage with them, which is very desirable. It's, in fact, it's one of the potential um, um, positives associated with this is the accessibility of of uh, the French language, but I, I think uh, of French language training. Um, but I, again, I think that um, that's something that we need to, to be very deliberate about. Uh, and we need to ensure that, uh, again, businesses are provided with the incentives to actually um, go out there and, uh, and, and offer that training and bring people in. I have a, just anecdotally and very quickly, uh, an example of a, a great um, opportunity that we pursued um, last year. And in fact, I mentioned this one because it's on our website, it's easily accessible. We worked on a, a francisation program with Mont Sutton, uh, the community of Sutton, Ampla Quebec, uh, and of course, individuals from around the area. Mont Sutton, is, as many of you probably know, is like many uh, of our uh, small businesses, uh, has, has ups and downs with respect to demand. Clearly on a on a cold, wintry, snowy day in February, it's much busier uh, in Sutton than it would be uh, in the middle of uh, in the middle of October, um, with respect to uh, individuals that want to come and visit. And consequently, they have ups and downs in terms of demand for labor. Um, Mo Sutton wasn't in a position where it was uh, actually able to satisfy all of the demand that it was uh, obtaining in those winter months. And so we engaged in a very collaborative way and with public, private and civil society sector partners in ensuring that individuals that in some cases were um, what I would, would classify as mature uh, members of, of the community, obtained the opportunity to, to, to receive French language training on site at Mossat in, in the off season. Um, and this was a program that was supported by a variety of players, again, from each of those sectors. No additional new resources had to come to bear. It was simply a collaboration from uh, Ampla Quebec, uh, the Eastern Township School Board, the private sector in the form of Mo Sutton, the, the municipality of Mo Sutton, and some civil society organizations that were working with this community. Those individuals were ultimately trained, they obtained uh, French language skills development, they participated in a francisation program, and they became very, very um, important resources, um, uh, team players within Mossat and, and enabled the, uh, the mountain to actually meet some of the demand that it was experiencing. So some really innovative and interesting ways to do this, but there's no doubt that we need to be very deliberate about the way that we consider um, uh, delivering that skills development for, for mature individuals. Well, that's great, John. Uh, it's a good initiative and perhaps a good template for other businesses uh, to, to be following. Um, I've always considered not only age, but experience, and as in my case, white hair, an advantage and not something that should be uh, looked down upon as someone is just too old to do a job. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Dubachny. Um, uh, I'd like to come back to the impact of Bill 96 on small, medium-sized businesses, because we regularly hear that the regulatory burden is going to be a real problem, is already under Bill 101 for not such small, but medium-sized enterprises. But those of us who are not in business may not really understand what we're talking about in terms of a burden here. Can, can you give an example of the kind of thing that uh, uh, PME is going to face? Of course, I, I'd be happy to. And in fact, um, it, it's worth noting as well, of course, small and medium enterprises um, are, are, are all about in, in, in Quebec. When, when we think of business, um, the vast majority of businesses in Quebec are small and medium enterprises. And, um, and, and represent together a very significant employer uh, within, within our province. And a, a reality of, of the regula regulations and the implications is that we sometimes generically refer to this as red tape. There's red tape, the, the, 
um, the operators of businesses need to comply with whatever uh, the regulatory environment within their jurisdiction um, demands of them. And so in many cases, it's, it's completing reports, it's submitting those in the same way that we we're all familiar with going through our personal income tax and we, we have to send in documentation, it requires time. Uh, this is an example of when we're looking at francisation and some of the implications, if we find ourselves in a scenario where we do have um, a certain number of employees, uh, then we do need to report on our ability to, um, to, to meet the expectations that have been established uh, by, by the government. As an employer, one needs to uh, communicate with their employees uh, in, in uh, the French language. And if they reach that scale and, and the owner or the operator of the business does not happen to be um, bilingual or does not happen to be a French speaker, they have to acquire resources in order to be able to do that translation, all of these things that we're also familiar with. The, 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 the heart of the matter is that it, it, the, the amount of time uh, associated with fulfilling that compliance um, is, is inversely felt, inversely felt on companies that are less than 50 individuals. So it requires more time because we may not, in a company that has fewer than 50 individuals, have a compliance officer or have someone that is working on this on a regular basis. And so in those companies, we see a disproportionate amount of time that has to be consumed in following up with what, again, and, and I, I, I apologize if it, if it uh, sounds dismissive, but, but red tape. Um, and that, that's not unique to, um, of course, English speaking businesses uh, at all. Uh, it's something that's universally felt within the uh, business community. Anyone that is uh, operating a business needs to respond to these compliance requirements and needs to consequently dedicate time. Now, again, a, a small business owner, and it, indeed, it's, it's, it's a real challenge sometimes to interact with small business owners because they don't have time. They are too busy focusing on the delivery of their skills, uh, delivery of their services, or of their, of their goods to be in a position where they can really uh, sit down and manage the paperwork. So every time we increase that, it in fact has um, a, a negative impact on, on their ability to produce, on their ability to be successful um, as the small businesses that they are. Uh, one example that struck me when I was reading um, Bill 96 was that uh, if you have 25 employees or more, you have to have a francisation committee and you have to tell the Office de la Langue Francaise when you're meeting and you have to provide reports to the Office de la Langue Francaise on what happened at your meeting, apart from all the compliance with just getting on with your daily life. Uh, indeed, the Office can just decide it's going to attend a meeting of your francization committee without bothering to give any advance notice. I, I don't know, this seems to me, how many enterprises of 25 employees or more are going to be providing these reports to the Office de la Langue Française. Is anybody going to read them? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Of course, we, we, we would have to see um, if in fact uh, this moves forward, but we are familiar, for example, within certain industries, so it's, it's quite, um, quite usual, for example, to see health and safety committees that need to be established when groups attain a certain scale. And of course, that is in the best interests of the uh, employees that are there. However, there is a, there is a cost and, and that's where the, 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 the regulations um, are not, um, uh, they're not sensitive to whether or not someone is an English speaker or a French speaker. They, they exist within a jurisdiction and everyone needs to comply with that. So there is a, a real cost again, in terms of time. And in fact, I think as we talk about the potential economic impact of Bill 96, I think this is why we have to be so deliberate about investigating the potential consequences. How much time would be required what, what would be the benefit of doing this? Would it have any impact? Would it actually help to achieve some of the goals that are associated with the bill? Or, or would it be perhaps just an administrative requirement that produces a report that no one ever um, pays attention to? In which case, um, you know, that's, a, that's, that's quite terrible to see resources being consumed for no particular reason. Um, and, and that's something I think we have to be very vigilant about. Okay, thanks very much. Let me just sneak in a little personal comment here that uh, although these hearings are about Bill 96, 
I couldn't help thinking when you were talking about the role of the federal government, what it is and what it should be, that it would be really nice to see those principles reflected in Bill C-32. No comment needed. Um, uh, John, thank you so very much. Um, as always, very interesting, structured, clear, thanks. Yeah, thank I want you. to thank above all my, my fellow panelists, Eleni, Eleni Bakopanos, Marcus Tabachnik, and today, Thomas Ledwell couldn't be with us, but he's been absolutely assiduous the other days, and he'll be back with us on Friday, because, as we said at the outset, these hearings have been so popular that we've had to open up another day, Friday, to continue them. And on Friday, we'll hear from, among others, the QCGN's Health and Social Services Committee, Eric Maldoff, as well as the Lord Reading Law Society. Both of those should be really fascinating presentations. Thank you again to all of our presenters. You've all helped so much to clarify our, our understanding of these issues. And thank you also to all the people who have been listening in and contributing in the chat. It's, um, it's just been a terrific experience. So we'll close for now and look forward to seeing everybody again on Friday. Thanks Thank you, again. John. Thank you, everyone.